Um, Michael is supposed to go first and then introduce me. Good morning. This is Michael Jones from TMA Blue Tech, and I apologize. Uh, I had a little bit of a technical issue getting on. Margaret, good morning to you. Good morning, Michael. So I'm going to tell a quick story, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Margaret, and then, of course, we're going to go right to Dr. James Green. Uh, last year in October, I was asked to give a talk at the National Academy of Sciences, um, who was thinking of putting a ocean-related uh, event together. And I, I was told that I should convince them that the ocean economy was important and big and that the technology was uh, uh, growing rapidly and blue tech was important. And so they gave me almost an hour to explain. And I was very fortunate that Craig McLean was with me. Uh, he answered all the hard questions. Uh, but at the end of the day, they then voted. It was, the, it was their um, supervisory group that they wanted to move forward. And in February of this year, the National Academy of Sciences did its first ever real event focused on the blue economy. Uh, and so it's exciting how uh, we here in San Diego, um, between the work of Scripps does, who's our co-sponsor of today's event, uh, work that TMA Blue Tech do, how we can influence uh, policy and, and research and others. So 
This is our, gosh, I think it's our sixth year, um, Margaret, although our first virtual, uh, where we're doing this together. And of course, as always, we are honored to be working with Scripps Institution Oceanography. Uh, and without any further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, you very briefly because everybody knows that there is um, uh, the information, the bios are in Whova. So we're not reading bios, but um, uh, we are very excited to be working with Scripps. And today is focused on applied ocean sciences for a sustainable blue economy, which of course fits beautifully with the uh, decade of ocean sciences 2021 2030. So Margaret uh, leads the Scripps Institution Oceanography. Uh, please read her bio. Margaret, thank you so much for being our partner for this second day of Blue Tech Week each year. And I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce yourself, of course, and then Scripps Institution Oceanography, and then Dr. Green. Great. Thank you, Michael. And uh, boy, I will definitely uh, second everything Michael said about the influence that San Diego and uh, and TMA have had on promoting the concept of the blue economy, uh, the importance of blue tech uh, within the blue economy. And uh, we have had the pleasure of being together in uh, not only in many venues in the US, but also in Europe uh, as the UN decade uh, is starting its preparatory uh, activities. But uh, let me add my welcome uh, also to all of you who are attending Blue Tech Week. Uh, thank you for being with us today, albeit virtually. And we would normally be enjoying the beautiful views at the Scripps Oceanography Campus. Uh, but we're delighted that we can have the conference go on uh, remotely. And this Blue Tech Week comes at a critical time uh, with this year's theme of Aqua Optimism and a continued focus on the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, Blue Tech Week is really helping all of us understand the world's ocean, uh, its importance to humanity, and the, role that the, and the role that the blue economy plays in that. And as Michael mentioned, uh, the United Nations has declared the years 2021 to 2030 as the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, or the Ocean Decade. Uh, the Ocean Decade will create a common framework that will ensure that ocean science can fully support nations in sustainable development of their coastal uh, and marine ecosystems and resources, and uh, support all of us in ensuring that the ocean beyond our national jurisdictions uh, is a healthy one and that, the, that we're aware of our impacts on, on that ocean. Uh, the ocean is the largest component of the Earth system and it stabilizes climate, supports life on Earth, and supports human well-being. However, the first World Ocean Assessment, which was released in 2016, found that much of the ocean is now seriously degraded with changes and losses in the structure, function, and benefits for marine systems. And we need to ensure that the ocean will continue to play the role that we've come to expect in global climate and food security as the world population grows to nearly 9 billion by 2050. That means that all of us, academe, nonprofits, NGOs, business, and government, must step up to play our roles in efforts to ensure that we protect ourselves by protecting the ocean. So the Scripps Oceanography was founded in 1903. Uh, we have been a leader in oceanography, atmospheric science, climate, and earth science. And as a, role, as a result, we expect to play a major role in the, the coming uh, UN ocean decade. We intend to leverage our expertise in marine and atmospheric science with engineering, policy, social science, and business to build partnerships to advance sustainable development. So Blue Tech Week is an important venue for us to discuss how the scientific community can partner because for us to be successful, our discoveries must be coupled with those who develop policy to foster their use, 
those who develop technique and technology based on the discoveries, and those who communicate the discoveries broadly. It's always a pleasure to come away from these meetings, seeing how our work can be coupled with all of that of other, with that of all of the rest of you. Uh, and that does indeed give me aqua optimism. So thank you all for attending Blue Tech Week and thank you to the Maritime Alliance for organizing this event. So now I'd like to welcome our keynote speaker, Dr. James Green. Dr. Green is NASA's chief scientist. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Iowa in 1979. And since then, he has had a storied career with NASA. He's worked at the Marshall Space Flight Center, the Goddard Space Flight Center, and was director of the Planetary Science Division at NASA's headquarters. Over his career, Dr. Green has received numerous awards, including the Arthur S. Fleming Award for Outstanding Individual Performance in the Federal Government, as well as Japan's Kotani Prize in recognition of its international science data management activities. We're so pleased that you were able to join us for Blue Tech Week. Welcome, Dr. James Green. Good morning. This is Jim Green, and along with Katherine Walker, we're going to talk about the intersection of the blue economy and the space economy. NASA has three key science themes, protect and improve life on Earth, discover secrets of the universe, and search for life elsewhere. Today we're going to concentrate on NASA's activity in protecting and improving life here on Earth through its Earth Science Program. NASA's Earth Science Program has over 20 operating missions not only free-flying spacecraft, but a significant number of instruments flying on the International Space Station. In addition, the Earth Science Program has nearly 20 more missions in various stages of development. With the data coming from NASA's operating missions, we create global measurements in order to understand climate and land processes. It is a complicated coupled system requiring years of observations. Now, for us to be able to create a sustainable ocean environment, we must make critical ocean and atmospheric measurements at high resolution and at an adequate cadence. For the oceans, measuring and modeling phytoplankton is critical. The ocean color observations shown here are a measure of the phytoplankton in the ocean, and the land observations are a vegetation index. This data comes from the SeaWIF satellite, which was launched in 1997 and operated until 2010. NASA came to the realization that observations like these are essential to make to understand climate variability. Clearly, satellite observations provide a unique and global view of our planet and have revolutionized Earth system science. NASA also supports numerical simulations in order to understand complicated interactions between land, oceans, and atmospheres. Phytoplankton are at the bottom of the marine food chain and are critical players in the Earth's carbon cycle. They are also incredibly diverse. This image shows the distribution of the dominant phytoplankton types from a high-resolution ocean and ecosystem model. And it's based on global observations from satellites and in situ ocean measurements. Different colors represent four different types of phytoplankton. Global models of CO2 production 20 years ago would have predicted an increase in CO2 far greater than we see today. We now believe that the increase in the amount of phytoplankton is occurring and that is taking advantage of that increase in CO2. CO2 increases is the main greenhouse gas 
producing global warming and it is outpacing the increased intake by phytoplankton. Today we have over 411 parts per million CO2 and it is continuing to rise. For more than a hundred years, tide gauge instruments on the coast have measured changes in sea level worldwide. Since 1900, measurements from these tide gauges indicate that global sea level has risen approximately 20 centimeters, or about 8 inches. Recently, we have combined multi-decade satellite observations with the tide gauge observations to rigorously reveal that the contribution to the observed sea level comes from two major sources. Now we understand that the process contributing to this sea level rise is due to ocean warming plus ice melting. This new knowledge of sea level rise can be confidently used to reduce the remaining uncertainties in the methods used to project future sea level rise. NASA's Earth science approaches to global observations are rapidly changing. The Earth Science Division has four major approaches. The first is to develop and demonstrate technologies that can be applied to a broad range of Earth science problems. Two, we want to build and operate satellite and airborne missions that deliver data to the science community. Three, we want to use satellite observations to turn measurements into understanding of the Earth system and processes. And four, we want to be able to help people around the world use satellite data to inform decision making to enhance quality of life on Earth. We want to be able to move from mission concept to execution and use new technologies to do so and facilitate this. Earth science is investing in technologies at different stages, at the component level, in information systems, in instruments, in in-space validation, in imaging and flight missions. These technologies focus on developing smaller, cheaper, lower cost components, putting them into full-fledged science missions based on the science observables desired by the community. These technologies focus on the development of new and improved instruments. Earth science targeted observables are shown here. Each color dot corresponds to current investments in one of several areas such as technology components, information systems, instruments, in-space validation, sustainable land imaging, and Earth Venture Technology Missions. There are five observables that relate to the oceans that NASA is performing with a number of new instruments and missions being developed. The ocean observables are ocean surface and wind currents, aquatic biogeochemistry, ocean ecosystem structure, radiant intercalibration, and sea surface salinity. Let's talk about a few currently or soon to be flying examples of NASA new missions infusing a variety of new technologies. First, on the right are CubeSats. They are testing a variety of technologies in the instrumentation area, such as RainCube, Harp, Tempest D, Cirrus, CTEM, Snoopy, and Cube RRT. On the left, around the Earth, there are already several examples of larger Earth science missions that have used these proven technologies or will use new technologies. Some of the examples of these flight missions are Cygnus and the upcoming Tropics, Prefire, and the Glimmer missions.
CubeSats, such as RainCube, which is radar in a CubeSat, is a technology demonstration mission to fly a KA band precipitation radar on a low cost, quick turnaround platform. Numerical climate and weather predictions uh, depend on measurements from spacecraft. Precipitation profiling capabilities are currently limited to a few instruments deployed in low Earth orbit, which cannot provide the temporal resolution necessary to observe the evolution of fast weather phenomena. However, a constellation of precipitation profiling instruments in low Earth orbit could provide this essential capability. Therefore, new instrument architectures using CubeSats and SmallSats will enable constellation missions and revolutionize climate science and weather forecasting. Another mission currently in orbit is the Temporal Experiment for Storms and Tropical Systems, or TEMPEST-D. By measuring the temporal evolution of clouds from the moment of the onset of precipitation, a Tempest constellation would improve our understanding of cloud processes and help to constrain one of the biggest sources of uncertainties in climate models. Knowledge of clouds, cloud processes, and precipitation is essential to our understanding of climate change. Uncertainties in the representation of key processes that govern the formation and dissipation of clouds and in turn control the global water and energy budgets lead to substantially different predictions of future climate in current models. So the goal of the Tempest D mission is to validate the performance of a CubeSat microwave radiometer designed to study precipitation events on a global scale. Another mission currently in space is the Cirrus CubeSat. Cirrus has one instrument. It is a small, lightweight, uncooled, infrared radiometer imager. Cirrus is capable of a wide range of scientific, operational, and commercial applications. One main science goal is to make images in three long wavelength bands to provide global land and sea surface temperatures. Another CubeSat in orbit is the Hyperangular Rainbow Polarimeter, or HARP, and it is a wide field of view imaging polarimeter instrument designed for accurate and comprehensive measurements of aerosol and cloud properties from space. Dr. Vander Lee Martins, the principal investigator of HARP, was flying over the Pacific and noticed that he could see rainbows in the cloud tops when he looked at them through a polarized lens. This led to him wondering, what causes that variation in the rainbows? HARP uses a prism and a polarized filter to essentially look at rainbows in the clouds to return vital information about aerosols, and those are the tiny particles in the atmosphere that act as cloud nuclei. Studying how these vary improves our understanding of aerosol impacts on the weather, climate, and air quality. Let's look at a few future missions in the CubeSat area. Total solar irradiance has been measured for over 40 years in an uninterrupted way. And the upcoming Compact Total Irradiance Monitor, or CTIM mission, would help reduce the risk of data gaps in the future. And it will be tested against the Total Irradiance mission that's flying on the ISS right now. The long-term balance between the Earth's absorption of solar radiative energy and the emission of radiation to space is a fundamental climate measurement. CTIM will allow measurements to be made with the same accuracy and long-term stability while using a much smaller and easier instrument to deploy 
and make those measurements. Let's now turn our attention to a couple small sats. Cygnus uses eight small satellites to capture telecommunication signals that bounce off the Earth. Cygnus can measure wind speed over the ocean using surface roughness characteristics. It can also detect land surface properties such as flooding and soil moisture. The Cygnus science goals are to study the relationship between ocean surface properties, moist atmospheric thermodynamics, radiation, and convective dynamics to determine how a tropical cyclone forms and whether or not it will strengthen, and if so, by how much. Finally, a small sat called the Geosynchronous Littoral Imaging and Monitoring Radiometer, or Glimmer, will be led by the University of New Hampshire and will provide unique observations of ocean biology, chemistry, and ecology. The observations in particular will focus on the Gulf of Mexico, portions of the southeastern United States coastline, and the Amazon River plume. And that's where the waters of the Amazon River enter the Atlantic Ocean. In conclusion, you know, when combining the space economy and the blue economy, space missions will need ground truth. This is so important to provide context. We'll need to calibrate remote sensing instruments. We will need to extend surface sense data in time and space. We want to connect surface observations to subsurface parameters. In other words, profilers relate sea surface temperature to water column depth. New steps coming up would be widespread monitoring. We want additional CubeSats for the ocean to be defined. And we're looking for ways where the commercial sector can contribute. We have to make decisions in terms of constellation missions or standalone. Our desire is to be always on and always watching. Thank you very much. We will be happy to take any questions that you may have. Hi everybody. Um, so in the interim time, I thought I could add a couple more topics to the talk we just heard from Jim. 
um, a couple of the uh, of the other sort of highlights of the Earth Science um, upcoming flights are something called the Pre-Fire Mission, um, which is uh, going to launch next year or should launch next year in 2021. Um, and it stands for the Polar Radiant Energy in the Far Infrared Experiment. And it's actually going to focus on uh, measuring the uh, radiant energy emitted at the, at the poles of the Earth, um, looking at, at Arctic and Antarctic warming. Um, particularly, it's going to look at um, that sort of wavelength in the far infrared that have never been systematically measured for the Earth. Um, until now, and it's, it's going to do so by using two, uh, two CubeSats that are going to fly um, sort of in tandem and they only weigh about six and a half pounds each, um, but they're going to have sort of massive um, solar arrays and they're going to be able to look at um, ice sheet melting and sea ice loss um, at the poles. So that's, that's one other one that's coming up uh, next year. And then um, uh, one of the other things that NASA is developing, um, particularly of interest to the ocean science community, um, is the ability to get rid of or um, clean up data, um, ocean data, um, uh, with regard to radio frequency interference, which is particularly bad for ocean measurements from satellites um, because of the, the sort of human use like cell phones and GPS and things like that uh, signals get in the way of measuring um, ocean signals. Um, and so we actually have a CubeSat, um, we actually have a CubeSat that's flying now called Cubert, Cube RRT, um, that is, uh, um, that's focusing on sort of finding those uh, um, interference patterns, particularly near the coasts, um, so we can improve coastal measurements. Um, yeah, so those are two more uh, sort of examples of, of what NASA is doing. Um, uh, something um, that we can also focus on is the use of those GPS satellites um, that are flying. You know, telecommunications companies put those up, uh, they're privately owned. Um, but the signals that we receive from GPS satellites can actually be used um, by NASA satellites to uh, improve um, science for the Earth. So. Um, those are called signals of opportunity. Um, and so that Cygnus mission that Jim uh, Green talked about in his talk um, uses those signals to, um, to uh, measure wind speeds off the ocean. Another mission that's coming up is called Snoopy. Um, and it's going to be using those GPS signals that are bouncing off of um, land and, and sea to retrieve different types of signals. So Snoopy is actually going to be looking at how GPS signals bounce off of the earth um, to measure soil moisture um, and also snowpack. Um, so it's actually really neat. Uh, a new um, measurement technique that has just been recently uh, started to be used, um, you know, sort of capitalizing on the fact that there are a whole lot of telecommunication satellites up there um, that we can sort of use as active sensors, um, we just have to put up the antennas to receive them. Um, so that's been going well. Okay. No, nope. uh, question. What is the best way for, oops, I can't see that. Let's see. Is there a way to make the, sorry, I can't see the whole question. <laughs> There we go. Uh, what is the best way for a blue tech company to enter into the NASA system? Um, yeah, so there are a lot of uh, active open solicitations. It's called um, the, the ones that are sort of open all year are called the, the Research Opportunities in Space and Earth Sciences, ROSES. Um, and there are plenty of technology programs in there. Um, you can have, you know, low, uh, low level technology, TRL level ah. technology. <laughs> Uh, sorry. Um, and uh, those are sort of entry level tech uh, proposals that you can put in all year. There are also specific, um, through the Earth Science Technology Office, um, there are uh, solicitations um, that happen all year as well for the INVEST program, which is the um, sort of investing in technology development. So those are available. Um, just look up ROSES 2020 um, and, it's, and it's there. 
Um, what does NASA need in terms of ground truthing? Uh, yeah, so that's a great question. So um, really anything that can uh, sort of um, focus on the coastal regions. Um, we have a lot of trouble uh, using satellite data around co the coastal regions in particular because you get that uh, radio frequency interference um, and other uh, sort of um, signal interference that occurs particularly near the coasts um, and because of a, because of those signal problems, and B, because of the sort of complex landscapes. Um, so really any, anything that would extend our observations um, spatially to improve spatial resolution, um, and then at depth as well, because most, almost all of the observations that we talk about from space are just surface observations. Um, so if you can sort of extend those from the ocean surface uh, down deep, profilers or gliders or things like that, um, or, you know, bottom sounders, things like that, um, would be awesome. How deep are you looking to understand ocean measurements? 10 meters or 50 meters, 100 meters? Um, yeah, so the question, it's a good question. So um, I know particularly, um, I personally am a, a, a planetary scientist. So looking at the surface of a planet, you can get so much information, but if you can extend that to deeper and deeper, you can get more information about how something evolves, right? So, um, you know, firstly, I think the, uh, the sort of first, first order um, solution that we need is to calibrate and validate the surface measurements that we can take from satellites. Um, so, you know, having sort of a network of um, ground truth um, uh, instruments is, is one thing. And then the next sort of thing from that is once you have your um, validated surface measurements, to extend that as deep as we can. Um, a few years ago, there was a, a, a proposal to use sort of a magnetic field um, experiment that we have sort of magnetometers going around the earth. We we're gonna try to measure the, um, the heat of the ocean using uh, the, magne the magnetic field data. Um, so trying to get deeper and deeper into the ocean from satellites um, that hasn't worked out yet, but um, you know, as deep as we can get from satellites, and then you can get this sort of global view. So if we can work out how to do that, um, that would be awesome. What is the estimated lifetime for CubeSats? Um, yeah, so those vary. Um, the longest one, I think, has probably been running for maybe three years. Um, they, you know, they are not as long lasting as uh, big standalone missions that, you know, uh, have been tested and um, sort of built for five to 10 year lifespans. Um, but they are tested and, and they do last um, not only for three, three years or less. Um, a, few, a few of them that are um, just sort of demonstration technologies, um, they, have, they go in with sort of a plant lifetime of one year. Um, but the, this, uh, the sort of uh, offset for that is that CubeSats are so much cheaper than standalone missions that not that you want to fill space with uh, garbage, but the... Uh, the sort of point is that you can put up another one when it when it uh, ends its life. So, awesome, thanks. Okay, great. Thanks so much, everybody. Um, I hope that you enjoyed Jim's talk, and thank you for having me over for the uh, Q and A. And enjoy the Blue Tech Conference this week. Thanks.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Ariel. Good morning, everyone. My name is Ariel. I'm the chairperson of IOC, Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO, and I have the great pleasure to moderate this panel on promoting ocean observations. Uh, observing the ocean is critical as it provides essential information for monitoring and forecasting change climate on timescales ranging from days to centuries. In addition, this information is proving to be more, more and more critical in industrial applications as there are ever increasing demands on this precious resource. The ocean is facing multiple challenges and its health shows signs of the now we are in the brink of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, where we are proposing a change of tack in the generation ocean knowledge through transformative ocean science solutions for sustainable development in people and ocean. And despite knowing that the ocean is the seventh largest world economy with a GDP in the order of two trillion US dollars, and that for every dollar we invest in ocean observation and science, we get $5 back, our level of investment remains really low. There's a clear need for sustained observation for capacity development and transfer marine technology to enable an acceleration in the generation and use of relevant ocean science for sustainable solutions. We can definitely not manage what we do not measure or understand. Under the current COVID pandemic, ocean observing networks and initiatives have of a important blow, not only affecting the generation of knowledge, but also having a ne negative impact in our ability to more forecast and predict ocean and climate change. We have now the opportunity to hear from top professionals and learn what they do, uh, promoting and collaborating on ocean observations. This is a great panel, and I will briefly introduce them. You will find longer bio in the agenda of the week. We have here today with us, and by uh, order, Dr. Stefano Ferretti, from of Science Applications and Future Technologies of the European Space Agency. Uh, he holds a PhD with a dissertation on innovative technologies for space habitats, a master in mechanical engineer, engineering from the University of Bologna, and a master of space studies from the International Space University. He attended executive programs in space policy and law, innovations and entrepreneurship and leadership at George Washington University and MIT. And he has authored several articles, reports and papers in the space policy and law, as well as science, engineering and technology. We have also with us Dr. David Legler, Director of Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program of NOAA. Dr. Legler currently serves as the Director as I said, of GOMO, the acronym, but NOAA's Oceanographic and Atmospheric Research Area. GOMO is leading NOAA's efforts to develop and sustain a global in situ ocean observing and related products for researchers, forecasters, and other consumers of ocean knowledge. He is currently co chair of the Global Ocean Observing System Observation Coordination Group and co chairs the U.S. Interagency Ocean Observation Committee. Also with us is Dr. Margaret uh, Leinen, Director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Margaret Leinen was appointed the 11th Director of Scripps Institution at UC San Diego in July 2013. She also serves as UC San Diego's Vice Chancellor for Marine Sciences and Dean of the School of Marine Sciences. She joined UC San Diego in October 2013, and she's an award-winning oceanographer and distinguished national and international leader in ocean science, global climate and environmental issues. Her research in oceanography and paleoclimatology focuses on ocean sediments and their relationship to global biochemical cycles and the history of Earth's ocean and climate enhances scripts in UC San Diego through her impressive career in academic research and administration, federal research, administration and non-profit start. And our last guest is Dr. Joao Tasso, from, is a professor at the University of Porto. Uh, 
and he's at the ECE department from Porto University and the head of the uh, Laboratorio de Sistemas e Tecnologia Subaquatica, LSTS. He holds a PhD and a master's in electrical engineering awarded by Porto University and his research interests include multi-domain unmanned vehicles, planning and execution control of, uh, for networked vehicle systems and applications to ocean sciences, security and defense. He's also chair of the Swedish Marine Water Center Advisory Board and member of the to Innovation Advisory Board. And with this brief introductions, I would like to give the floor for first presentation to Dr. Stefano. Uh, Stefano, your floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Ariel. My name is uh, Stefano Ferretti. I work in the uh, Science Applications and Climate Department of the Earth Observation Directorate of the European Space Agency. And I'm also the coordinator of uh, the ESA Earth Observation Atlantic Regional Initiative, of which uh, I'll be uh, presenting and talking about today. Next slide, please. Uh, the vision uh, of Earth observation at ESA is to fill in the pulse of our planet. We do that uh, uh, via a number of uh, satellite missions and data exploitation platforms. Next slide, please. The Earth Observation Atlantic Regional Initiative is a demand-driven suite of activities, which include projects, user consultations, workshops, stakeholders engagement and outreach activities and it, it identifies needs uh, uh, for the development of future applications and, and services. In order to match the demand with uh, our uh, space supply capabilities, while identifying the most uh, suitable solutions, we created an open science environment where the sharing of data and information can occur through the uh, Earth Observation for Society website, in addition to exchanges with users so via social media and innovative digital tools, such as the soon-to-be-released Atlantic Data Handbook. Next slide, please. The next slide, please. The Earth Observation Atlantic uh, uh, Regional Initiative is therefore conceived as a platform at the convergence and the intersection of many different actors, users, and stakeholders, representing three main elements society, economy, and environment. These elements are further developed by research institutions and academia, for example, through the ESA Ocean Science Cluster, through with public authorities and downstream sector, for example, through the Earth Observation Industry and uh, uh, new entrants uh, also involved in the Artificial Intelligence for Earth Observation Initiative at ESA, and the digital world uh, through, um, for example, thematic exploitation platforms, uh, network of resources, and the Eurodata Cube. Uh, next slide, please. Next. Uh, next. These are a number of stakeholders that we have engaged with. And uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, particularly uh, in, the context of, of, in the context of the Atlantic, uh, the paradigm of sustainability and innovation. So disruptive innovation and science grand challenges require a new approach, in our opinion, that allows for the integration of environmental models with socioeconomic indicators in order to address emerging trends related to the blue economy to the renewable energy and the climate change impacts, also in view of coastal resilience. ESA has already started the development of innovative applications projects addressing some of these most pressing needs of Atlantic stakeholders, ranging from innovation clusters to foster blue economy growth and sustainable development in the Atlantic region. Second, maritime spatial planning to support uh, our member states in the implementation of the European Union Directive. Third, renewable energy produced by innovative ocean energy technologies and offshore wind farms, including also floating platforms, reducing maintenance and operations time while increasing safety. And last, Atlantic cities and ports enhancing social cohesion and job creation while limiting the impact of economic activities to the ocean environment and by creating new tools 
to fight emerging pollutants such as also marine litter. Next slide, please. Therefore, the ESA, um, uh, the ESA Atlantic Regional Initiative addresses Atlantic challenges at large in terms of geography, north, south and east, west, organization leveraging the competencies and capabilities of the various actors in a sort of team of teams. Next slide, please. It also aims uh, at building new capacities in the region uh, by sharing know-how and consolidating research activities among the various countries. Somehow with this wide dimension is unified under the space umbrella of this regional initiative of ESA, thanks to the digital organization of the processes, applications and platforms, and to the co-design approach which favors open innovation and the continuous improvement of the services, technologies and products for the benefits of the end users and the citizens at large. With this, I thank you very much and I remain available uh, for the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And uh, our next speaker will then uh, Dr. Uh, David. The Thank you, Ariel, and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, and there are some slides here I hope that we'll be able to see. Um, so I, it's a really exciting time for marine science. Next slide, please. The world's oceans are better observed now than ever before. We have new technologies and capabilities that have enabled the development of systematic observing of most of the upper 2000 meter of the global oceans leading to improved knowledge about the ocean's role in weather and climate and improved monitoring of the ocean in support of sustainable fisheries and the vibrant blue economy. NOAA's Global Ocean Monitoring and Observing Program, which I direct, supports about a good fraction of the, these sort of globally distributed observations noted here. And we now have systems to regularly monitor and track how well we're doing in terms of those uh, observational systems and how their health in this, in this capacity, we also work with hundreds of partners around the world in various countries and organizations and academia and universities and private sector uh, to help make this a uh, reality. Our program in NOAA is also a sister program of NOAA's IUS program, which has more of a coastal focus. Next slide, please. Our work is coordinated internationally by the Global Ocean Observing System, which is co-sponsored by the WMO and IOC. GOOS has played an essential role in coordinating the distributed uh, observing system, which I depicted, in, which I depicted previously, that just provides the backbone for weather and climate products and services around the world. However, there are increasing needs and expectations for ocean observations, especially for addressing three targeted application areas, climate, operational services, and ocean health. So in the GOOS 2030 strategy in the support of a blue economy, contributing to weather forecasts, particularly for improvements of hurricanes, which we note particularly this week as we've seen uh, Hurricane Iota, which is uh, just made landfall yesterday, uh, fisheries markets, uh, deep ocean exploitation, and even polar regions. It's vitally important that we move out on this strategy. As we heard at the Ocean Ops Conference uh, back in September, where the community of international ocean observing uh, experts met, to meet the growing demands of policymakers, private sector users, and the general public, there needs to be a step change in the breadth and extent of the ocean observing system. Next slide. To achieve this vision for expanding and integrating the ocean observing system, that's going to require more partnerships with representatives across the value chain from observing to services, with a particular emphasis on better connections with stakeholders and end users, whether they be in technical, governmental, industrial, or even societal and NGOs. Improved stakeholder and end user engagement is a commitment that both NOAA and GOOS share. NOAA is focusing on strengthening among ocean observing interests within our own organization and with our partners and working to ensure there are clear transition planning processes to facilitate better uptake and incorporation of new technologies and data sources. GOOS will also need to evolve to offer more inclusive governance, increase expertise and engagement, and foster knowledge exchanges to develop a robust and truly global ocean observing community. And they are very active in planning those activities. These uh, changes over the next decade are not gonna be easy. 
The ocean observing system is largely been a research-driven enterprise, and we need to reckon, work to reconcile this research-driven agenda with a growing service and market-oriented approach in order so we can help uh, harness those communities together to develop and deliver the services and knowledge that we know we need to. A big challenge with embracing these new expectations and demands are the is how we create partnerships and enable those new partnerships. To address this, we, meaning NOAA, GOOS, and ocean observing communities, are increasing global to national to regional coordination and partnerships to ensure service delivery from all of the various ocean observing programs that are active. We do that in many ways with many partners because by joining forces, it's usually advantageous. Even within our own agency, we recognize that working with other ocean observing activities within our agency and others throughout NOAA, for example, to improve hurricane forecasts through pilots, assessing the utility of gliders, drifters, AUVs, and other uncrewed vehicles, and transitioning those technologies into routine operations are vital. We're working with academia and the private sector on sensor improvements, new technology pilots, and figuring out how to transition them into the marketplace. We're also engaging in the UN decade planning as a means to foster transformative research and new partnerships. And I'm sure you'll hear a lot about that in this conference. Next slide, please. So what types of contributions and partnerships could be impactful for global ocean observing? I tend to bend them in four broad categories. One is um, we need to address geographic and distribution needs. While we have a globally scaled system, we're not able to observe in many places. For example, in the polar regions or in undersampled regions like off the coast of Africa, or even emerging areas of interest such as the deep ocean. The second category are areas in scientific needs where we have new requirements or new opportunities. So they're um, thinking about the boundary layers between the ocean and the atmosphere, the ocean and the land, or the ocean and the ice, along with new and additional needs for biogeochemical and even biological sampling require even more research and development to meet that global demand for uh, more information. Technological development. So here you can think about technology and how it's going to help us overcome some of the challenges in terms of meeting those new requirements. So development of new sensors, new platforms. Uh, but that technology doesn't have to necessarily be limited to hardware. It can also be in modeling and assimilation and delivering of services, which is the last uh, category here that we've We've already demonstrated that global ocean observing is critical for operational forecasting, uh, but there is more to be done in that service area for which we can need help. So we're working together at NOAA and GOOSE to leverage the coordination cooperation. And we're thinking big about um, the ocean observing community and we need to think that we need to think bigger and take different risk and more risk. And so at this point, how we think bigger and think differently is a work in progress. So I pose a few questions in conclusion that we've been wrangling with and I pose here to the audience, thinking about the process for incorporating or integrating disparate contributions as part of that observing system. What can the ocean observing community do to help promote new markets for oceans data and encourage the creation of new and better products and services? And my second question is, how can better, how can different stakeholders across the ocean observing value chain better communicate and engage? I think that's an area we really struggle with. So lastly, in conclusion, NOAA has huge equities in the ocean observing systems, and NOAA must be responsive to changing times and opportunities, and to be clear in our intent while exploring new models of partnering and supporting sustained ocean observing that encourages and rewards all participants from research, industry, governmental, and other communities. Thanks for listening, and I look forward to the discussion later today. Thank you very much, uh, David, for your presentation. And uh, now it's the uh, turn for our next panelist, uh, and Margaret. You have the audience. Thank you, Ariel. Um, I'd like to remind us that not too long ago, uh, we weren't looking at these kinds of global uh, capacities for observation. And uh, one of the, the great oceanographers of Scripps history, Walter Monk, once characterized the last century, the 20th century, as the century of undersampling the ocean. And by sampling, he meant both taking physical samples and taking measurements. So it was the century of under-observing. 
And I think that the community now uh, is really focused on making sure that the 21st century is not a century of undersampling or underobserving the ocean. And in thinking about that, uh, I think it's instructive to look back to just the beginning of this century, uh, 1999, when the, the most comprehensive set of measurements that we had for the, the surface of the ocean, and by surface I mean not just the, what we can see from satellites, but the upper ocean. The most complete view that we had was from the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, WOS, which was a decade-long program from 1990 to 1997. It uh, had ships occupying lines across the ocean, uh, steaming to location, taking uh, water samples and making measurements uh, all the way to the bottom, bringing the, the samplers up, steaming off, uh, you know, for uh, a few hundred miles, taking another sample. It took a decade to be able to look at the whole ocean. And that was the most comprehensive look at the ocean that we'd ever had. That was only 20 years ago. And we have completely revolutionized our view of the ocean since then. And that really began just at the end of the World Ocean Circulation Experiment, when a group of directors of oceanographic institutions, about eight of them from around the world, got together and said, the scientists at our institutions are developing new, new ways of looking at the ocean using autonomous vehicles. And we think that this could revolutionize ocean observation. So let's get together. Uh, we can foster from within our institutions the development of these capabilities. And we can promote that, that capability outside. So in 1999, they formed what was called the Partnership for Observation of the Global Ocean, POGO, uh, which still exists today uh, and is now far more than eight institutions. Uh, and represents most of the uh, not only academic research uh, ocean organizations, but also governmental organizations, and has really fostered the development of Argo. And you saw that wonderful diagram that our map that Dave Legler started out with, with dots all over the ocean, almost 4,000 um, Argo floats, unmanned fr floats, that every five days do a complete uh, section of the upper 2,000 meters of the ocean and come and send back uh, information on depth, location, temperature, and salinity. Uh, this has absolutely revolutionized our thinking about heat in the ocean. Uh, it has not only allowed us to understand that the ocean is warming, but where it's warming, how fast it's warming, areas where it's actually cooling, uh, and to get that integrated view. Also, the salinity measurements have allowed us to look at how salinity is interacting with circulation in, in incredibly different scales of, of resolution than we ever had before. So this, uh, and, and in 1999 also, uh, the organizations came together, together with government organizations to have the first ocean OBS meeting uh, in 1999 to promote this idea of Argo and its development. And then we've had uh, an ocean OBS meeting, a global ocean OBS meeting, every 10 years. So in promoting ocean observation, it has been key organizations coming together and mutually fostering the development of these, these ideas. I, I think that uh, one of the important things to uh, also highlight is that our capacity for ocean observation and capability for ocean observation is dynamic. It's always evolving. And uh, today, Argo is an array of floats that measure primarily physical chemical variables, temperature, salinity. 
A few of the Argo floats have oxygen sensors. And now we're evolving into a new capability to be able to look at the biogeochemistry of the ocean uh, through, through floats that will also have uh, uh, the capability of measuring nutrients like nitrogen, phosphate. So we're adding this capability to the Argo array. And the entire oceanographic community was uh, just uh, buoyed up to hear uh, just a couple of weeks ago that the U.S. National Science Foundation has provided $53 million to, uh, to outfit more floats for biogeochemical observation and to make that the beginning of biogeochemical Argo, uh, a component of Argo. So we're on the cusp of being able to transform our ability to observe the biogeochemistry of, of the ocean. Uh, and that's a really important new uh, capability. Uh, in addition to this, we're growing the capability to be able to look at the ocean in full depth with new uh, um, uncrewed vehicles, uh, that autonomous vehicles, that would be able to uh, measure uh, uh, these parameters all the way to the ocean bottom to give us the first sense uh, in detail of what's going on below the upper 2,000 meters. And you know, I think um, in the same way that we, uh, before Argo, we used to really focus a lot on maybe the upper 100 meters or 200 meters, talking about how dynamic it was and then how much less dynamic it was below that level and how much less dynamic it was at, at great depths. And with Argo, we've really transformed our ideas about how dynamic the upper 2,000 meters are. And I think that's going to happen with deep Argo as well. So it's promoting ocean observation for the understanding and the use of that data that's so important. Uh, I'd also like to highlight that there are other forms of observation uh, that are really important. and and are developing in the, uh, uh, in the community. And one of those is uh, the ability to look at, uh, at organisms themselves, at biology itself. Harmful algal blooms represent major coastal hazards that lead to closures of fisheries, uh, closer, closures of beaches, and of course tourism is one of the largest uh, sectors of the global economy. Uh, obviously, they're a disease risk uh, or a, a health risk for people, uh, and they also have an incredible effect on marine ecosystem structure and function. Uh, and these phenomena have caused substantial economic losses to fisheries and tourism uh, in many parts of the world. In the last decade, the ocean science community has developed several novel sensors and methods for monitoring and predicting a diversity of harmful algal bloom events. And these include the imaging flow cytobot and the environmental sample processor and various modeling systems optimized for harmful algal bloom prediction. Uh, here in California, led by the Southern California Coastal Ocean Observing System, the California region has a deployment of seven new uh, imaging uh, flow cytobots uh, to be able to uh, generate images of particles taken from the marine environment. And those images show us the biology, the organisms that are part of these blooms. And they continually capture high resolution images of uh, suspended. Sorry, Margaret. Yes, my apologies, Margaret. Can, can we round up? So yes, let's... absolutely. Uh, what I wanted to focus on was that this is a very different kind of observation than what we've been uh, thinking about before. And I think what we're now engaged in is the promotion of ideas for how we can actually look at the biology of the ocean and have that uh, uh, experience the kind of revolution that we've seen for physics and chemistry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, 
much for the presentation, Margaret. Uh, and yeah. now it's the turn for our last uh, Joao Tasso. Joao, please, please come up. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, because I'm in Europe. So, my name is João Souza, and I'll be talking about ARC, the Atlantic Autonomous Robotics Consortium. Next slide, please. So, basically, I'll talk about goal and attributes. The goal is to create and manage a unique set of long-distance testing courses and facilities for... Uh, just give me one second here, please. Uh, for use by companies, government agencies, and NGOs from around the world. Few attributes. Distributed coordinated operations and support centers in Eastern uh, Atlantic. This means uh, Azores Islands, Canary Islands, Lisbon, Madeira, and Porto. And these represent the half circular arc around the entrance to the Mediterranean. 24-7 operations center for data and vessel communications, autonomous underwater, surface and air vehicles. Of course, we are concerned about interoperability. An important observation is that no location is too far to preclude assistance or recovery. More about this soon. Uh, of course, we want to test long distance, persistence and long term position, residence. Uh, we want to have differentiated pricing to promote information sharing by corporate users and scientists. We want to have uh, give access to students, uh, testing operations and exercises. And the concept lends itself to the interception of blue tech and space tech. Next slide, please. So these are some of the assets that we're talking about. Uh, surface uh, vessels, autonomous surface vessels, like the blue sail, the, then uh, gliders and uh, UAVs. Next slide, please. And this slide is very important because the, this map will help us to understand how do we address persistent presence in the ocean. So here you can see uh, continental Portugal, then the Canary Islands, some of the Azores Islands and Madeira Islands in the middle. And then you can see also locations of existing robotic centers in Porto at Poca and Canary Islands, planned robotic centers in Azores and Madeira, and also planned 24-7 uh, operation center in the Azores. And then if you look at the distances, no spot is more than 500 miles from assistance. And this is very important if you want to have a persistent presence in this uh, area. Next slide, please. Uh, so basically, we want to put forward a new organizational model and a cooperative mindset. We want to provide a single point of entry for clients to use the network. We want to leverage existing and develop new facilities as needed. We want to coordinate programs and also coordinate closest on water support and recovery. Of course, uh, very much in line with the previous presentations, also getting, uh, getting involved in ocean observation programs, bridging science and technology. Keep in mind that the Atlantic uh, Ocean will work as a key element to the triple helix framework academia, industry, and policy makers. And of course, we want to start small and grow uh, healthy. So we want to think about phase technology development programs. Next slide, please. Benefits. So uh, ARC is about doing more with less. And it's also about doing something that cannot be done in isolation. So ARC will bring together an array of stakeholders, including academia, government, industry, military, NGO, and others, to promote ocean robotics-related collaboration and a blue voice for the region internationally. Next slide, please. Uh, of course, ARC will build on existing partnerships and uh, centers. Two examples, POCA in the Canary Islands, so they've been deploying gliders in the Atlantic. And we at Port University 
have also been deploying uh, lots of different types of uh, autonomous vessels in the Atlantic. Plocan uh, also started the successful glider school. We at Porto uh, started 10 years ago a uh, joint exercise with the Portuguese Navy, invitation only, uh, now CMRE from NATO and also the MUS initiative from NATO also joined this the organization of this exercise. And in 2019, we had uh, over 800 people, nine ships, including one manned submarine, over 50 AUVs, ASVs, and UAVs operating together for about two weeks. We had people from seven navies, and uh, this exercise then again brings together people from academia, the military, and industry. So then again, one step forward in what regards ocean uh, observation in a sustained presence in the ocean. Next slide, please. So these are some of the assets that we've been deploying, in this case, in the Azores uh, Islands, Azores. Next slide, please. Joao, uh, then again, uh, sorry to interrupt. Yeah. We, we are running almost out of time. So if you have an opportunity to receive questions from the audience, that will be very much appreciated. Okay, so I just need uh, one more minute. So next slide, please. So basically, uh, the ARC partners are uh, Air Center, uh, which is an international collaborative framework for inter integrative approach to space, climate, ocean, and energy to address global challenges in the Atlantic Ocean. Forum Oceano, which is the Portuguese maritime cluster, Vocan, and TMA Butec in San Diego, a California based nonprofit uh, industry association and cluster organization for the largest US Butec cluster. Next slide, please. Next and last. So basically, this is what we'll be doing next. Uh, so engaging uh, potential partners and we've got very good feedback from them in the last slide please and i'm almost there so what we're doing next we are here we will also be present at the all atlantic uh, forum uh, that will take place in south africa remotely uh, ocean business and uh, ieee uh, mts oceans conference in a call to action please Join us on our journey to better understand the ocean. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Joao. And uh, well, it is true when we have uh, so so dedicated, so devoted to ocean observations, we get all right. Uh, we may have time for at least one question from the audience. I would like to ask the uh, technical team from from Blue Tech Week, uh, if we have questions from the audience, and if we can get this uh, on screen. Yes, how does no potential partners? So. I guess that uh, one's for me. David? <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm happy to try to address that. So NOAA has various means by which we identify partners. Um, we do that through uh, competitive grants processes for research activities. We also establish uh, through the private sector uh, cooperative research and development agreements and any number of agreements through just direct correspondence. We write, routinely issue requests for uh, information, which is also helpful and informs our various uh, activities across the agency for which helps us also make connections. Okay, thank you very much. I see we're le on just about a minute and a half from uh, shot out of this of this session. I encourage all participants to try to contact distinguished panelists. And uh, of course, a reminder, and it was mentioned several times, we need to further develop partnerships. We need sustained obser ocean observations and we need to spread the word about the value all these organizations and other organizations are doing for the benefit of us all. And the UN decade will give us a great opportunity to set the uh, clear foundations uh, to, to get that observations of the ocean we so desperately need. Thank you very much. 30 seconds away. You may have another sessions now. I would like to uh, thank 
our panelists for the great presentations and their passion. See you all soon. Thank you.
All right, good morning, good afternoon all, depending on where you're located. Uh, welcome to this session titled Observing with Acoustics for Ocean Ecosystem Health and Biodiversity. Uh, my name is Jason Gadamke. I work at NOAA Fisheries, managing the Ocean Acoustics Program in the Office of Science and Technology. Uh, today's session is focused on the use of acoustic techniques to explore, study, monitor, and understand ocean ecosystem health and biodiversity. We have four experts on our panel with experience in academia, government, and private industry. Each speaker will be giving a short presentation, and we will do all of these consecutively, reserving time at the end for a question and answer session. Now, I'm just going to quickly set the stage for this session. Uh, the ocean is primarily a world enveloped in darkness. Light, for the most part, is filtered from the water within a few hundred meters, limiting the ability to make visual observations underwater. Sound, however, travels exceptionally well in, in water. I always like to refer back to an experiment that was conducted in the early 1990s called the Heard Island Feasibility Test. This experiment was conducted just before I got involved in the field of underwater acoustics, and it really opened up my eyes to the possibility of using sound to study the ocean. It was designed to test the ability of low-frequency man-made acoustic signals to travel throughout the world's oceans. The researchers deployed a series of underwater speakers in the Southern Ocean uh, near Heard Island. Now, at the same time, receivers intending to listen for the sound were placed many thousands of miles away along relatively straight line paths into the Atlantic, Pacific, and Southern Oceans. Now, what is particularly interesting is that the day before the experiment was even to begin at full power, the researchers began a series of low-level transmissions to calibrate the equipment. Lo and behold, three hours later, those signals, those test signals, were picked up in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans from receivers on opposite sides of the Earth, on the order of 15 to 20,000 kilometers away. This experiment was an eye-opener for me on the power of acoustics to study the ocean. While it was an incredibly complex experiment, it simply and beautifully illustrated that sound literally has the ability to travel halfway around the world and beyond. Now, for millions of years, marine life has used the efficient sound propagating properties of the ocean as a primary means to communicate with other individuals, as well as to sense and to learn about the ocean environment. Humans may have been a little late to the game, but in recent years, there has been a vast increase in the ways that we use acoustics in our studies of the oceans. From the perspective of the ocean uh, acoustic program that I manage, NOAA is heavily invested in using acoustics to learn about how marine life uses sound and how human produced noise may be impacting marine life. To accomplish this, about five years ago, we initiated the Ocean Noise Reference Station Network. This is a series of passive acoustic monitoring stations deployed throughout the US uh, EEZ to allow NOAA to assess changes in soundscapes and introduced human noise within locations over time, as well as to compare soundscapes and noise broadly throughout US waters. Today in this session, we will be hearing about a range of similarly exciting and groundbreaking acoustic techniques from our speakers. Now, with that brief background in mind, let's move on to our speakers. All right, and I believe we are going to start with uh, Dr. Kevin Heaney, the Principal Scientist and CEO of Applied Ocean Sciences, a collective of ocean consultants conducting high-caliber science, pushing the boundaries of technology and innovation, and collaborating with academic, gov government, and nonprofit uh, partners towards their overarching goal of making the ocean safer, cleaner, and more resilient. Kevin has spent a scientific career exploring the interaction of the ocean environment and acoustic propagation. After receiving his PhD uh, from Scripps Institution of Oceanography, Kevin has worked for a variety of companies before starting Applied Ocean Sciences in 2019. Today, Kevin will be speaking about his work on global ocean soundscapes and the model impact of the COVID economic slowdown, as well as his work modeling shipping noise in the Arctic. Uh, Kevin, you can take it away. All right, thank you, Jason. I, I had to drop off and re-sign on two or three times during your presentation, so hopefully this will work. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, global ocean challenges, and for today it's going to be shipping noise primarily. Um, just as I really appreciated Jason's intro, the ocean sound travels very well. It's a dark place, and it's also mostly a noisy place. I'm also, I appreciated the shout out to Heard Island. I did my PhD thesis on that experiment and project. Um, so next slide, please. Ooh, these are not the right slides that I sent you, but this will be good. This is the ocean noise field. Um, I plotted on, on Google Earth for a, a month average in April, and you can see shipping lanes. There's regions where um, this is just shipping noise. Bathymetry impacts the noise. Um, 
And in particular, you can see up in the northern region, sound travels very well. The sound channel is near the surface. And so on this presentation, I'm going to go through the model we've developed. And the goal here is to um, use the shipping noise levels to, to bring um, health, it, evaluate the health of the global ocean, not so much coral reefs and local sound speed. So sound travels really well in the ocean. We'll go over some propagation stuff. And I'll show you some global models, the COVID model, and a picture of the Arctic. Um, there's too many slides here, so I'm just going to jump to good pictures. So let's go to the next slide. Um, this is that sound in the ocean as a function of frequency on the x-axis and level on the, on, the, on the y-axis. And you can see the blue line there is earthquakes. The orange um, red is shipping noise. And then the blue lines are wind noise. So these are the three primary drivers of ocean noise. Next slide. Um, sound travels really well, in the, as, as Jason pointed out, um, and it, it's depending on the bathymetry and the seafloor, and it travels very differently in very different parts of the ocean. Next slide. So the sound sources are wind, waves, rain, marine mammals, and lightning, as well as man-made sources of shipping and seismic exploration. Um, at the lower frequencies, we can hear seismic exploration at the other end of the Atlantic Ocean Basin. Next slide. Um, we'll, we'll just keep moving on. <laughs> um, yeah, so in, in COVID, the economic slowdown really reduced the numbers of ships in the world. And so um, Spire Incorporated, which puts up satellites, has provided us with a global coverage in March and April. And we're going to do a 50 hertz model showing the reduction in sound levels as a result of COVID on a global scale. Next slide. Um, here's a single um, realization, a snapshot from April 2019, where um, there's about 25,000 ships. And you can see the northern hemisphere is significantly louder than the southern hemisphere. And, the, and particularly in the polar regions, sound travels very, very well. There are regions in the South Pacific where primarily wind noise is driving the field. Um, next slide, please. We've run that model and then averaged over a month. This is April 2019. Again, you can see the shipping lanes, particularly going around the Cape of Good Hope, South Africa. And um, the shipping lanes aren't quite clear in the Atlantic and Pacific because they overlap. Next slide. And this is April 2020. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see the difference. Um, we can do next slide, please. Um, and now you can see that there's significant areas where there's bright red. This is from 0 to 5 dB. Again, 3 dB difference in the background noise level amounts to animals being able to hear in communications at, at basically twice the distance. Um, so it's a significant number. Some of these are a result of there not being many ships, like off of Antarctica. Some of these are a result of moving shipping lanes. But there's wide regions where there's a 3 to 5 dB difference in received level um, from April 2020 to April 2019. Next slide. Um, here's some line plots in the Atlantic. Um, the, blue and, the blue and black are March, April 2020, and the red and yellow were March, April 2019. And you can see in, mo in several of these places, I tried not to hand pick things. Um, um, there's, there's about a 3 dB difference. Next slide. And this is sites in the Pacific. North of Hawaii, it's significantly quieter this year than last year. Um, um, actually, I think I got the references of those wrong. The 2020 is the quieter year. Uh, next slide. All right, so we're also doing modeling in the, in the Arctic. As the ice melts because of climate change, there's an increase in shipping. And so we're looking at a five-year plan funded by PAME and the World Wildlife Fund just to look at shipping noise in the Arctic. Next slide. Um, and here's, a, here's the soundscape model from there with a the blow up on the right of the Barents Sea, lots of ships north of Norway. Um, the Bering Sea, which is, you know, a few ships pass through the Bering Straits, lots of activity off of Russia, and then the Davis Strait, where there's a lot of mining activity from the Canadians. Next slide. And here's a blow up of the two. Um, and actually, I'll leave it here and I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up and conclude. Um, there's, a, there's probably um, 500 and growing number of publicly available uh, hydrophones that are out moored, and there's 10 to 20 uh, receivers that are out that have, are cabled to shore. And so there's a vast increase in the availability of data for the ocean soundscape. And if we have data and we have long-term time series, we can calibrate our models and we can begin to understand where is the ocean noisy in a way that is traumatic to marine mammals and therefore fishing um, and, and sustainability on the North Shore. 
Um, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up right there and pass it back to the speaker. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, we'll be moving on now to uh, Mike Connor. Uh, Mike is the CEO of Thermann, a company that designs, manufactures, and operates systems to collect acoustic and electronic information on the world's oceans. Mike has a wealth of experience over a 35-year career, rising to the rank of Vice Admiral in the U.S. Navy. While doing so, he broke new ground in undersea communications, development of undersea networks, and development of technology to support extended range undersea weapons. Today, Mike will be talking about some of the innovative underwater acoustic work their man is conducting. Mike, please take it away. Uh, thank you, Jason. I'll be building on the uh, work of Jason and Kevin. And uh, what we try to do at our company is we have practical applications of the types of science that Kevin was just talking about. Next slide, please. Uh, our company uh, combines experienced mariners, most of who have come out of either the Navy or the Coast Guard, uh, with technical talent that we recruited out of the mostly greater Boston area so that we can take some of the things that we used to do in manned ships and submarines and do them uh, much more efficiently and effectively and in many more areas by leveraging autonomous systems and autonomous sensors. Next slide. Uh, our, the things that we offer fall into sort of two categories. One is the use of passive acoustics or passive electronics. And we just completed a project where we use those to look at uh, illegal fishing activity. And then on the right, you'll see we have some active systems which use primarily active sonar and, and uh, the synthetic aperture variant of that to do some very precise mapping. Next slide. And, and one of the points I wanna make here is that when you're studying the ocean or modern activity, whether it's for security or protection of fisheries and so forth, you can do amazing things with relatively small vehicles towing relatively large sensors that can detect activity at very long ranges, classify it with digital signal processors, and apply some AI techniques to determine what people are doing across broad areas. And we think this is important to the future protection of the ocean, uh, not to mention a number of uh, security aspects. Next slide. And then on the uh, active acoustic side, uh, we're really getting into precision seabed mapping with synthetic aperture sonar to the point where we can get three centimeter resolution to study uh, what's going on on the ocean, uh, to look at uh, the impact of things that we do, to look at the condition of subsea infrastructure, and to look at the impact of that infrastructure on the ocean environment. And I'll just show you a couple of examples of that. Next slide. So here you can see some, uh, you can see a communications cable that crosses an oil and gas pipeline. Actually, it's the other way around. And uh, in some places where things are exposed, you get to look at the condition. Uh, if you look at the lower section there, where there is infrastructure, and when it's in sensitive, shallow environments, it's supposed to be buried. Um, sometimes that's easier said than done because the seafloor is a very dynamic place and sometimes the seabed is scoured away, which has impact on other people trying to use that environment, maybe fishermen, for example. Next slide. And here you can see uh, how we use uh, this synthetic aperture sonar to look at the condition of undersea infrastructure. And then you can see where the infrastructure emerges from the seabed and you can look at the condition of both the seabed and the infrastructure. And uh, that's important for some of our energy producing customers as well as the people who regulate them. Next. And this is another example of uh, oil and gas, in this case, a, a liquid natural gas pipeline where you can get a good assessment of the condition of of the hardware and the environment uh, using a system that can cover that region at about three square kilometers per hour. So it's very efficient and yet very precise and effective. Next. And, and this is the slide I just want to dwell on for a bit is um, we're in the business of helping ensure that uh, people who are putting infrastructure on the seafloor are doing it properly. 
And um, that's important to a lot of people, uh, especially fishermen and others who want to preserve the fisheries. But um, in the process of doing that, one of the things that we see every day is the impact of that fishing on the seafloor and all of the biology that, rel that relies on that. So um, what, what has occurred to us while we're looking at this is everyone is very concerned about things like the uh, preserving the the Amazon rainforest because they can see what's happening uh, visually from satellites and so forth. Well, the more that we can look at the seafloor with efficient collection means with this level of precision, uh, we can look and see if you know we might be doing the seafloor equivalent of uh, clear cut foresting uh, in our own backyard. But because we don't normally see it, uh, we don't normally do anything about it. So we're trying to help raise visibility on that. Next. And then uh, we feel that by having the information we gather available immediately, uh, that helps us, uh, A, serve our customers, uh, serve uh, the government so they can enforce safety in the environment. Next slide. And thank you. I'll pass my time to uh, Jason. All right, thank you for that, Mike. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Jules Jaffe, a research o oceanographer at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, Jules' research interests are broadly concerned with the use of new technology for observing oceanic phenomena and the development of techniques for their interpretation. His research is focused primarily on ocean ecology, where several acoustic systems he invented resulted in uh, first ever behavioral observations of zooplankton in their natural environment. Most recently, he's developing underwater microscopes for in situ characterization of micro and macro plankton, uh, with his work supported by the National Science Foundation, Office of Naval Research, California Sea Grant, among many others. Today, Jules will be speaking about acoustic soundscapes and the quest for monitoring marine protected areas. So whenever you're ready, Jules. Okay, thanks very much. I appreciate the invitation of the conveners of this conference and also uh, happy to meet my co-panelists. Uh, uh, the title of my talk today is Acoustic Soundscapes and the Quest for Monitoring Marine Protected Areas. And uh, the story is simple. About six or eight years ago, Ed Parnell and Anna Shirovich uh, and I decided it would be really interesting to propose to the local sea grant that we could listen to sounds in the kelp forest and thereby figure out uh, you know, something about the ecology and perhaps even estimate animal abundances. And we were aided in our efforts by a postdoc at that time, Jack Butler, and Camille Pagnello is a graduate student close to finishing up. And uh, what I wanna to talk to you today about the results of that work. So if I can have my first slide, the second slide, please. So uh, as many of us are familiar with, there are a number of marine protected areas along uh, the coast of the United States, be there uh, any, any coastal areas. And these areas were set aside because the fish populations were dwindling. And uh, we want to be able to create the sort of places where animals could grow and even export those populations to commercial and recreational fisheries so that we wouldn't kill the last fish in the ocean and there be, therefore be out of that. So this, this graph, this picture just shows the Southern California. And here in La Jolla, we actually have quite close to where I work at, uh, at Scripps Oceanography, a few marine protected areas, which we decided to target for the placement of both uh, hydrophones and also cameras. So my talk is about combining acoustics and optics in order to make the best of both of them. So if I might have the second slide here. So the question is, can habitat species diversity and abundance be quantified using passive acoustic monitoring? And here we're showing a nice slide that Camille made where we show a number of underwater recorders in this kelp forest that are being surrounded by a number of species. I'm particularly interested in measuring biology in a non-invasive way so that we don't disturb the organisms that we are observing. And passive acoustic presents a wonderful opportunity for simply listening and trying to figure out what's going on. I was trying to think of a terrestrial example 
that would be more relatable to folks. So imagine your neighbors are having a, a party and you're sitting uh, in a place where you can hear them and you're trying to figure out uh, how many people are there and maybe who they are. And so we're eavesdropping on this underwater acoustic environment with the hopes of characterizing it. My next slide, please. Next slide. Okay. So this is a, a picture of the, quote, known soniferous kelp forest fish, the, the, the fish that are actually making sounds. But I want to emphasize that some of these are sort of happenstance and, and you know, you can catch a fish and it sort of makes sound and you don't really know if it's making sound underwater. So part of our objective was to actually characterize which are the organisms that are making sound. So in the next slide, you'll see a device that we invented. And one of the wonderful things about technology today is that it's getting less and less expensive and the capability of processing things more and more. Mike gave a nice talk about using artificial intelligence technologies. And the idea was, can we use a camera to take a picture of a fish that is vocalizing and thereby be able to characterize which species are making which sounds. And one of the wonderful things is that the camera technologies that are commercial now, while not extremely inexpensive, are in a realm where, you know, for a couple of thousand bucks, you can buy an amazing camera, put it in a housing. And in the next slide, I'll show you uh, what we came up with. So here we're showing on the vertical axis of the graph, light intensity in lux, <laughs> one of my least favorite units. And on the horizontal axis, we're showing time of day. So notice we start uh, before sunrise and we end after sunset. And below what you're seeing are five pictures of organisms, fish, that we took with this camera. And what's the amazing thing about this camera, and I've been doing imaging now for quite a long time, uh, is the sensitivity of it. And as you can see that even before sunrise and, and when it got dark, the line actually shows the light level, uh, we can actually image fish. And so uh, one thing we know about biology is a lot of the action occurs in the quote crepuscular times that is sunset and sunrise, when the predators are uh, looking for prey and the prey are looking to eat. And so this is now a window into a world that we have very little information about. So in the next slide, I want to show you uh, a example of an organism. So on the, the leftmost color plot here is what the acoustics people call spectrograms. And we won't go into the details, but basically frequency goes vertical, time goes horizontal, and it's a sort of fingerprint of what we're hearing. And, and on the middle slide B, what you're seeing is the actual waveform. And then in C, you're actually seeing an image of a sand bass that made the sound. So if you guys can click on the audio, everyone can hear what that is. Can you click on the audio? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> can you go back? <laughs> OK. <laughs> I guess we don't get to hear the sand bass. <laughs> All right. Uh, in any event, uh, there we go. Okay. So if any of your neighbors sound like that, <laughs> you know, they've got a fish in their house. But realistically, we're trying to fingerprint the organisms in the kelp forest and thereby measure their abundance. And the cool thing about the camera is it's 24-7. And if you do diver surveys, you've got a couple hours. So there's a lot of cool ecology we think we can accomplish in addition to technologies to measure abundance. The next slide shows a, uh, some results for a paper that we're preparing that uh, Jack Butler, who's who's uh, no longer with us, he's, he's in, in Florida now. And what we're seeing here, it's a little complicated. I don't wanna go into the details. You have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We've characterizing four kinds of signatures of organisms. And what you're seeing is how they vary in a function of light and day. And as I've said, they come out at night. And on the right, what you're seeing is a vessel monitoring uh, as, record. And as Mike had talked about in his lecture, we think that these passive systems will also be able to tell us something about who's there and who might not be there. So in summary, we've uh, been able to combine acoustic and optics. We're learning lots about the ecology, trying to fingerprint the fish. And in the next slide is my thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you all today.
All right. Thank you, Jules. Um, our final speaker is Geraint West, uh, Global Business Manager Oceanographic with Sonardyne International. Uh, Geraint has managed Sonardyne's relationships with the ocean science community since 2016. Previously, he was Director of National Marine Facilities at the UK's National Oceanography Centre, during which time he set, set up its Marine Autonomous and Robotic Systems Facility and commissioned the research ships James Cook and Discovery. Originally trained in the Royal Navy as a hydrographic surveyor, uh, Geraint subsequently worked for Fugro, conducting airborne laser hydrographic surveys. Today, he will be speaking about some of the exciting work Sonardyne is doing in underwater communications with ROVs and in the use of acoustics to monitor oceanographic conditions. Geraint, take it away. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, next slide, please. And can you just click on the animations quickly on there? Yeah, well, I'll keep this short. I mean, Jason gave a, a very nice introduction to just how powerful sound is in the water. Um, but I wanted to point out that we are still using other medium, uh, sorry, other means uh, within water for communicating and, and imaging. And, and that's been touched on a couple of the previous talks as well. But what it does mean, of course, is that sound has become the workhorse for what we do in the oceans. Can I get the next slide? Yeah, so within Sonar 9, I, I guess the things we do are um, come under th three main areas, um, positioning, communications, and monitoring. And I'm going to take uh, three examples of those in my next few slides to, to just touch a little bit on how we're using those and the versatility of those and where things are going uh, within trends in te technology. But this nice little infogram here really shows you how sound is working for us to position, communicate and monitor right from the deep ocean into the coastal waters. And in that context, um, you'll see the kind of thing we're, we're doing is anything from positioning manned submersibles to positioning divers. And uh, just to take the local interest from Scripps, uh, one of the things we're doing is working with scientists there to position uh, monuments on the seabed to centimetric level using sound from a wave glider to monitor plate tectonics. But that's a whole different talk. So can I get the, the next slide, please? I mentioned that uh, quite a lot of what we do is for positioning vehicles um, and submersibles from large research vessels, but we're seeing that technology get to ever smaller levels these days. Uh, and this is a great example of something that we're doing with small ROVs uh, with a group down in Australia. Uh, they're working for the Victoria, Victoria Department of Environment Land Planning. Uh, and part of that is um, characterizing biotopes in uh, Port Phillip Bay. It's one of the most diverse places on the planet for seaweeds and reef systems, sponges and other invertebrates. But it is in the shadow of the city of Melbourne, which is, has a growing po population of nearly 5 million people. A key part of the work that Fathom Pacific are doing is to provide models and maps and monitor the bay's marine biotopes. Uh, that's areas of the bays that provide habitats for specific species and that's to support decisions on how to manage the bay. Creating that data has to be quantitative and accurately georeferenced because what they're doing is running anything from video trans transects to mosaicing of photos. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about that project, then there is a, a URL on there which you can find on our website. Moving on to the next one, please. So moving across the world from Australia to the North Sea, this example of uh, what is happening in the communications world, we're seeing a steady transition to the use of unmanned systems. And this is actually uh, BP's Macca field, which is about 120 miles east of Aberdeen. In this case, what they're doing is injecting water into the reservoir to maximize the output of that. The downside of that is it leads to seabed deformation, which needs to be monitored. So. In 2018, um, we helped install um, sensors on the seabed to measure that deformation. Uh, and that uh, network of sensors is expected to operate for 10 years in situ without change of batteries. An example uh, of, of data collection then, in April 2019, BP went to check that data and they used uh, one of these X-Ocean USVs for that. 
So that was a transit from a trailer launch on the shore. So very low footprint operations. That transited out to 120 miles offshore, circled in a 25 to 30 meter radius above the sensors and harvested data from each sensor. Crucially, that also included simultaneous operations working within the 500 meter exclusion zone of an intervention vessel. And one of the key things here is the quietness of the USV itself means that the noise is less of an issue. So that adds to the significant benefits that you get in health and safety um, by not having people out on site, environment, carbon footprint and cost, of course. So next slide, please. So moving on to monitoring, this is an example of the Gulf of Mexico loop current system. Um, I think many of you will, will be aware of this, but what we have here is a, a, a highly dynamic system, which is critical to both hurricane forecasting and offshore operations. Every so often, you get these loop current eddies that spin off. Uh, they can be several hundred miles across and 500,000 meters deep with current speeds in excess, well, sorry, up to about four knots. They're shared about every eight or nine months, but there's also deep eddies associated with them that propagate independently with speeds of up to about a knot and a half. So can I have the animation on that? And the next one, please. So what we did in uh, 2018 is working with the University of Rhode Island. Uh, we deployed a network of pressure inverted echo sounders, uh, a 60 kilometer spacing. These measure simultaneous pressure and two-way travel time, or, or a, a measurement commonly known as tau. Tau is correlated to water column structure, um, but also what we had with each of these sensors was a single point current meter moored above each instrument. Now, the network's due to be recovered in June 2021, but what I want to show you here is this really nice example of the transition of uh, Hurricane Barry in, uh, in July 2019. You can see uh, data from uh, some of the northerly sensors there, uh, and what is immediately apparent, of course, is the tidal cycle. But the other signal you see there is changes in the time of, of, of arrival, the, the two-way travel time. So this is reflecting changes in both the temperature, but also the pressure and, and the water level that you have as that hurricane transitions. Um, love to have more time to go through this, um, but uh, I think what's really nice is you can see that transition. Uh, but you can also see a number of early returns here. And one of the things that that's thought to be is associated with uh, transition of fish through the area uh, during the period of the hurricane. So wrapping up, um, what I'd like to say is acoustics still is the workhorse for positioning, the communications and monitoring at sea. It actually takes the detail to make it work well. As you've already heard, environment affects acoustic performance, but conversely, performance is an indicator of environment. But really exciting bit at this, uh, I think that will have hopefully come out of the few words I've had to say so far, is that unmanned technology is really giving us new possibilities in this arena. So thanks very much for your time and delighted that you participated in this. All right, Garin, thank you very much for that. Uh, we now have about, uh, let me just see, six minutes or so for, a, for questions here. Uh, I'm waiting to see the questions pop up on my screen. Uh, here we go. Uh, apologies, folks, this is blocked by my window here. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jaffe, such interesting info. How are oceanographers communicating these technologies and research results to the industry and the public? Well, thank you for your question, and I appreciate your, your uh, appreciation of our work. I'm pretty much uh, just like this, um, uh, communicating at conferences, you know, as academicians, we need to be publishing in, in, in journals and communicating at conferences. And uh, if you have any ideas, whoever has asked that question about how we can reach more people, send me an email, jjaffe at ucsd.edu. We'd be happy to talk about it. Thank you for your question. 
And I'll just actually open that up to the other panelists. If you guys have any thoughts on uh, communicating uh, these types of techniques and things to the public, do you have it? Does anyone want to comment on that? I will. Um, we have a project, the Arctic Project, which is funded by World Wildlife Fund Canada and on the Arctic Council. The primary objective of that um, project is to communicate um, up the stream towards policymakers in the global shipping noise region, um, which is very international, and then um, open it up to the public. And so we're using websites and we're interacting with the indigenous people on the North Slope and the, the Arctic um, residents. And so communication has become a significant part of what, what do we do with the science that we discover? Great, thanks, Kevin. Uh, I have another question here, if uh, if everyone is okay sitting on that now. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, Grind, uh, can you talk more about the early returns and fish in the area during hurricanes? Um, yeah, it, to be honest, it's not really my area of expertise. Um, but I, I know when speaking to Professor Randy Watts at URI, uh, the postulation is that, that these are fish that are actually transiting the area ahead of the hurricane. Um, this has been seen in several studies before. Um, what is interesting, of course, is from those three plots that I showed is that there's not uh, an equal distribution there. Um, they was certainly more prevalent on, um, on one of those plots than, than the other. All right, thank you. Um, I'm just, ah, okay. Well, there appears to be half a question here. Do you work with scientists for tracking? Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if they're talking about tracking marine mammals, at least if the question was asked to me, that would be the perspective I would take on it. Um, yeah, but does anyone want to jump in on that? Sure. Uh so we track marine mammals uh, for commercial customers and for uh, U.S. government, and we, we do work with scientists. We work with scientists like Kevin, uh, uh, who develop a lot of the algorithms, and then the uh, results of most of that work uh, ends up in the public domain, usually via the regulators uh, of those activities, and so uh, yes, we do. Great, thanks, Mike. Um, and I will just mention from my own perspective, uh, I actually got my PhD doing work with minke whales on the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, and I had set up an array of five hydrophones, um, and minke whales were, were uh, quite easy to work with in this sense, is that they produce sounds at a very regular repetition rate, and with the hydrophone array, I could for hours track the movements of individual whales as long as they would keep singing and look at the interactions uh, between whales and so on. Um, all right, uh, moving on. Uh, Mike, please talk about finding and integrating new technologies. So the way you do that is you participate in forums like this so you can find what you don't know. And, uh, you know, I came out of 30 years in government, and it turns out the volume of things I didn't know, I didn't know was quite large. So uh, keep coming to these seminars, learn and talk with the people who invent these technologies and then figure out how you can uh, commercialize them. Excellent, thank you. Uh, all right, this is, is out to the group, I believe, but uh, how are acoustics impacted in hurricanes and typhoons? I'll go first on that one. Um, first off, hurricanes make a lot of noise. They're observable on the United Nations has a network of cabled observatories out in the open ocean. And they've heard hurricanes. We're pretty sure we could track them with it. Um, and then if you're in the, again, if you're in the local area, there's a lot of sound being put in the water from the surface waves. And in terms of propagation, really high wind speeds mean really high waves and waves scatter sound. And so the propagation environment would be different. I just saw a really interesting yeah. paper on some tornadoes with, with acoustics as well. Yeah, if I we had a time 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 time. Time. Sailing, oh, sorry. We had autonomous system sailing through uh, hurricanes Isias and Laura this year. And our experience is during the hurricane, you can't hear anything. Uh, you just hope to survive it and be ready to start work uh, once things calm down. 
Yeah, what I was going to say is uh, with the pressure inverted echo sounders that we've had on the seabed, um, we, 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 what we're actually measuring with the acoustic is the change in temperature effectively. It's the water structure. Um, that's a nice thing about working from the seabed um, up to the surface that we've got actually still the quietness down in the seabed and we're transmitting that. So a lot of that measure, that difference in tau that you see in those plots I showed is around the temperature structure changing as the hurricane transitions. All right, and fantastic. Thank you all very much. We're out of time. Uh, thank you very much to the panel um, and to the audience for, for asking questions. Thank you.
Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you may be, uh, whatever it is. Uh, welcome to our session on hydrography technology and applications for coastal resilience in a changing climate. Uh, my name is Larry Mayer. I am the director of the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. I'm going to moderate this session. Uh, and let me start with a, a little introduction to the session. I think it was about, it was about a year ago. Um, that there was a White House summit on ocean science and technology and Margaret Leinen, a good friend of mine and the director of the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, commented that the oceans were having a, a moment. And it really captured the excitement that we all had of the fact that here we were in the White House and yet we were at a symposium that was really focused on ocean and science technology. And since that time, the, the momentum has continued and what I found most remarkable is that a lot of that momentum has really focused on the concept of ocean mapping and hydrography. Uh, on a national level, uh, we're seeing an evolving uh, national strategy for mapping, exploration, and characterization of the oceans. Uh, on a broad regional level, the Galway Statement has called for the complete mapping of the North Atlantic, and there's lots of activity trying to reach that goal. And on an international level, uh, the UN Decade of Ocean Science and Support of Sustainable uh, Development has called for the complete mapping of the world ocean, recognizing that we, we can't manage and protect what we don't know and understand, and that the accurate prediction of uh, climate and many other ocean parameters depends on a detailed knowledge of the seafloor boundary conditions. And of course, uh, the Nippon Foundation uh, JEPCO Seabed 2030 program uh, has been established, which is trying to facilitate this complete mapping of the world ocean by 2030. I have to admit, in uh, my more than 40 years in this business, and I know I look much younger in this uh, virtual environment, but uh, it has been more than 40 years, I've never seen such a recognition of the importance of uh, ocean mapping. And I have to say, not too, uh, not too quietly, uh, that it's about, it's about time. Um, at the same time, we're also seeing a uh, remarkable advance in the technology that will aid and facilitate uh, this mapping. Uh, advances in autonomous systems, uh, high-speed communication, artificial intelligence, um, machine learning. Um, and it's this convergence of the recognized need for mapping and the evolution of these technologies that offer tremendous opportunities for the private sector for academic research uh, and uh, for NGOs. Uh, and we have a great panel gathered today um, representing these three sectors. And I'm going to call upon them to offer their insights uh, as to how their sector and their organization are addressing these issues. Uh, the plan is that each of our panelists will take on the order of five, six minutes or so uh, um, to offer their comments. And if they stick to their time, we should have about five or maybe 10, maybe more minutes at the end for questions and discussion. So I want to start right away. And let's start with our first speaker, who will be uh, uh, David Miller. And I should say the, the more detailed bios of our folks are, are, can be found uh, on the website. Uh, David is the Government Accounts Director for the Americas uh, with Fugro. Uh, and let me just turn it over to you. Go ahead, David. Okay, thank you, Larry. Good, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good ev evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be part of this discussion today on hydrography. And my presentation here is, uh, is sh short and we'll discuss how innovation is changing hydrography at Fugro. Next slide, please. For those that don't know, uh, Fugro is the world's leading geodata specialist. We provide uh, people, equipment, expertise, and technology to support the exploration, development, production, and transportation of the world's natural resources. And we do this using geodata, and you can see the types of geodata uh, that we manage here on this slide. For us, in our world, hydrography falls under geophysical. Next slide, please. So we're using this geodata to unlock insights for our clients. This starts with acquisition of data, uh, subsequently then analysis of that data, and then finally providing advice and consultancy to our clients on those data to help design, build, and operate their assets safely and sustainably. Next slide, please. 
So technology development and innovation is accelerating and reducing the costs of hydrography. And as Larry mentioned, it's really a convergence of technologies and core technologies that is enabling this to happen. It relates to remote operations, robotics, autonomy, advanced analytics, connected data, and client interfaces. Next slide, please. Looking at Fugro's specific innovation and technology development, there is several disruptive hydrographic technologies. Uh, and we'll start here looking at the left, where we have uh, Earth observation analysis. So it's the use of satellites and satellite remote sensing to monitor and detect change, particularly in the coastal environments. Next is the use, uh, development and use of on-crewed surface vehicles. So where this mapping and hydrography work was traditionally done using uh, sonar from crewed vessels, it's now possible to do the same operation from on crewed surface vehicles. In the same vein, uh, in an airborne sense, we are also able to utilize now unmanned aerial aircraft to deploy our bathymetric LIDAR systems and our LIDAR technology to map shallow clear waters uh, autonomously from, uh, from on crewed aircraft. We have new developments in our bathymetric LiDAR capabilities, uh, next generation systems that are capable of providing high resolution data in optically clear water at depth. Uh, and those depths can be up to 60, 70 meters, but the difference being uh, significantly higher resolution than prior versions of the technology. And then also the use of uncrewed surface vehicles, not just to do the mapping, but to deploy um, electric ROVs and AUVs that are hosted from those autonomous platforms to do uh, high resolution seafloor exploration and characterization. All of this is done uh, in a remote command and control context uh, using uh, technologies uh, for command and control from our remote operation centers. Next slide, please. Looking at our coastal mapping and hydrography toolbox, uh, there are numerous tools uh, available, enabled by the technology on the, on the prior slide. Um, and these range from lower precision on the left to higher precision on the right. And at the left, we start with our satellite um, nearshore spatial intelligence capabilities. So again, satellite remote sensing to uh, monitor uh, for change and detect those changes when they occur. Uh, when those changes are detected, we can then determine the, uh, the appropriate technology for uh, quantifying the nature and scope and magnitude of the change. That could be using, again, satellite methods such as satellite drive bathymetry in optically clear water. If higher resolution and accuracy is required, uh, then we can deploy LIDAR solutions. Um, and as mentioned, these LIDAR solutions could be operated from either manned or unmanned aircraft. Um, and then even uh, if higher resolution or higher accuracy solutions are required, or if the environmental conditions do not support LIDAR, then traditional sonar can be deployed, again, from either crewed vessels or uncrewed vessels. Uh, and then MedOcean, of course, connects all of these um, products and services as well. So one size does not fit all, and there are different tools for different projects. Um, and we can deploy a single tool or an integration of all of these tools, depending on the, the nature of the requirement. Next slide, please. Just a couple of applications here uh, related to the technology that I mentioned. Uh, first here is coastal change detection. Uh, so this is in a disaster response and recovery scenario, looking at uh, Hurricane Dorian from last year in the Bahamas and using our uh, 40 SD, uh, and I approach to look at the, uh, the changes that were uh, occurred in, the, in this area of the Bahamas and determine uh, the, 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 the nature of the change and the magnitude of the change and determine what type of resources were required um, to, uh, to respond to that change. Next slide, please. Uh, the, another application here is the use of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in our workflow. So I've really focused on kind of platforms and, and sensors, but the data that we collect can now be uh, processed and handled in, in a more sophisticated way. 
And here's an example from an offshore wind project in, in the northeast of the US uh, where AI and machine learning uh, algorithms were used to detect over 1.7 million boulders on a single project. Uh, and this work would have taken literally months to a year uh, of human intervention and, and uh, analysis, and it was done in, in days and, and weeks. So uh, an example of how these solutions uh, are, uh, are helpful as well. Next slide, please. So just a summary here, uh, Fugro is unlocking the insights from hydrographic geodata to help create a safe and livable world. And this supports numerous efforts, uh, as mentioned by Larry uh, in, the, in the introduction, including the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Uh, and next slide, please. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to uh, further discussion on this subject. Thank you. Well, thank, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, David. I, I think we're just going to move right on so we can try to leave some time for, for questions and discussion. And our next speaker is uh, Dirk Rosen. Uh, Dirk is the executive director and founder of Marine Applied Research and Exploration. Over to you, Dirk. Thank you. It's uh, nice to follow you, David, because I'm going to talk about uh, the living resources. And what I love about this first slide, if you can see it, is on, on the lower portion of the screen, you'll see a small little robotic vehicle tethered to a ship, and it's a massive ocean, and that's what we're uh, faced with as we try to inventory. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what the Earth provides that we don't quantify as far as an ROI, but every other breath you take, the oxygen comes from the sea. It's sequestering a, almost a third of our carbon dioxide. It's cooling the planet from the burning of fossil fuels. It's more than 90% of the habitable space on the planet, provides most of the protein for 2 billion of the 7 billion people, and holds invaluable mineral and pharmaceutical resources. Next slide, please. So just as a, a way of looking at what we know and what we don't know, land is, is not that much altitude involved. The oceans are deep and opaque, and we can't see them very well. So on land, we've surveyed just about everything, at least at a surface level. Visually speaking, the ocean remains a frontier. It's only 5% visually explored. On land, which we know much better as, as humans, we've protected and uh, created reserves of 16% of, uh, of the area, whereas underwater, we've only uh, forbidden fishing in about 5%, and, and hopefully that'll continue to grow. On land, we have a concept of land ownership. Uh, the ocean in many places still remains the wild, wild west. So with that in mind, next slide, please. I wanna talk about sustainable living resources, uh, fisheries first and foremost, but the mapping, as David explained first, is critical to identify areas for exploitation and for conservation, and this really speaks to sustainable resources for future generations. And this is where robotics come in, is, in, is defining the impacts from our laws, from our fishing gear, uh, and then uh, the efficacy of reserves or parks. The World Bank estimated last year that we're losing about 83 billion annually due to poor fishery management and practices, and we've got to get beyond that. And it's going to take a nexus of government, science, engineering, enforcement, and the private uh, sector, much like this uh, group is meeting. Next slide, please. So this is how we do our work. We do what's called strip transects with robotic vehicles along the seafloor. We catalog and inventory every single thing, not just the habitat, but the fish and invertebrates. We have a, a team of marine biologists that have identified the critters. I think we're at about 3 million identified down to species level, which we are now uh, using to train uh, machine learning devices to help us get through this huge uh, glut of data. Next slide, please. So this is what it looks like. Uh, exploring the ocean, you come around a corner, and obviously you can't see this from mapping above because these fish are on the sea floor, but these are sought after a, a number of different species of fish off the California coast uh, in a fishable area, not a reserve, and uh, for whatever reason, they're aggregating right here. And it's, uh, we call it a honey hole, but it is uh, 
unpredictable often, and then they do move on a daily basis. So some good news. Uh, in the marine reserves, and we have 124 of them networked together in California now, we have seen uh, an increase of 280% in the fisheries that have been targeted by fishermen, both inside the reserve, which are the red bars, and outside, which are the blue bars. The result means that fishermen are doing better, both recreational and commercial. And it's important to have a baseline, document existing conditions, and then monitor over time. Next slide, please. So there's going to be some pressures uh, with the need for exotic minerals for battery technology. We're going to be looking at deep sea vents. Next slide, please. Manganese nodules and other types of aggregations on the sea floor. Next slide, please. But it's also overlapping with habitat of these critical deep sea coral sponges that are growing in and around vents and manganese fields. And the reason these are important is some of these animals live 10,000 years and they can't move. They have to heal themselves in place. So it makes total sense that some of the enzymes used from these uh, organisms have resulted in testing protocols for COVID-19 and are in vaccin vaccination trials. They're leading to cancer drugs. They're already in the pharmaceutical chain of prescriptions and all sorts of other applications as well. So we. If we have an inventory, we can judiciously decide whether we mine something or, and maybe it's we're mining the pharmaceutical aspects or we mine the mineral aspects. Next slide, please. And the reason is we got 133 countries, as best I can count, that have ocean access. And what we need to do is empower those nations, especially the political, politically willed nations to manage their own inventory. Inventory and manage it. Next slide, please. And so that's what we have done over the past 17 years is develop the methods and protocols using robotic tethered technology, real-time control from a ship, and we are moving into the autonomous realm with cloud-based anal analysis. So next slide, please. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, these are just a few images from the seafloor. Well, th thank, thank you very much, Dirk. Uh, let's, let's move on now. I think our next speaker is going to be uh, David Vincentelli. David is the Managing Director of uh, IX Blue Sea Operations. Uh, David? Yes. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here talking to, to this crowd, um, even visually. Uh, we, we all agree about the importance of collecting uh, large-scale uh, data of the, of the seafloor and of the water column over the seafloor. And uh, among the axes that um, XBlue is developing to, to uh, develop a sustainable uh, model for large-scale data collection, uh, we're investing a lot in autonomy. And uh, I will just show you a few slides to illustrate that and uh, hopefully opening uh, for future discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So why we are we believe in the, in the concept of uh, autonomy? Um, it's to maximize the efficiency of the target gathering from shoreline to offshore, um, maximizing the, the our time at sea by reducing human exposure and uh, and the efficiency of the tools. Uh, we we have experienced the uh, better line keeping, better survey speed and uh, for a lower um, a carbon footprint we are uh, capable of uh, today um, uh, providing high quality high data quality uh, with a very much lower impact uh, which is very important if we want to uh, invest more into data collection um, so as I, as I said, we also so we reduce the human exposure, and we also uh, work to integrate into what uh, it's already in place, into the concept of operation of a near shore a survey or offshore operation together with um, uh, ad uh, ad graphic offices, for instance. Next slide, please. So what was our path to autonomy? It started from uh, from a tool, um, and we we worked hard to uh, as we remove the human being to uh, improve a shape and uh, to focus on the high uh, data quality collection. Next slide, next slide, please. And we developing now a, a complete ecosystem. 
an ecosystem means uh, interfaces from uh, shore to offshore integration uh, method of, uh, of operation and concept uh, and also all the communication uh, to uh, to control and to gather all that amount of data uh, next slide and uh, I thank you very much for your uh, uh, for listening and uh, I hope that we will uh, continue this discussion among with my uh, other panelists thank you <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, David. <laughs> okay, our, our next uh, our next speaker is going to be uh, Julia. Julia is uh, a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, my alma mater, and uh, I think she does mostly coastal process stuff, looking looking at uh, complex wave models. So, Julia, go ahead, please. Hi, right, Larry. Thank you for the introduction. Um, yep, I am a postdoc at. Uh, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and I'm also with the uh, Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation. So if you could uh, roll that video, it's supposed to be underneath a bunch of words, but that's cool. Um, uh, so what we're looking at here is the um, waves as they rush up over the beach down into the street. This is Cortez Avenue at Imperial Beach, California. And um, they're rushing up over that beach, heading into a garage. Uh, in this condo. And so this is part of what our group does. We're working on forecasts of large total water level events, which here on the West Coast in San Diego are largely a combination of high tides and high waves. So this event was one such day. It was about two years ago. Um, and we had forecasted that this was going to happen. And we scrambled to get our observing systems in place for this event. So if you look down on the bottom left-hand corner here, you'll see a terrestrial LIDAR um, on, the, on the corner of the balcony there that's scanning the waves. And that helps us to get validation for our forecast model. Um, just to see, we want to know how much water is going to be rolling into that street. Um, you do need to know a number of things, and that includes the regional and the, I'm calling it hyper-local bathymetry. So if you can advance there. All right, so as we all know, um, rising sea levels are going to lead to increased coastal flooding and hazards. No matter what the sea level rise scenario is, uh, our flooding days are predicted to increase. So here in San Diego, the intermediate scenario from the NASA flooding days projection shows that almost every day by the end of the century is going to be a flooding day. And what that means is that nuisance flooding or the occasional wet street is more likely to damage our coastal infrastructure. And for instance, this, this middle picture here that you're seeing it has, I think this is from an El Nino event. Um, there are some waves that are encroaching on Highway 101. And uh, this is a major transportation corridor in our coastal cities. And this is something that we're going to see a lot more of as we head into the future. And right now we're a couple days off of a king tide or maybe one day off of the king tides. And those are the largest tidal swings of the year. And they're good indicators of what our, our flooded future will look like. So again, as I said, on the west coast of the United States, most of the flooding does come from um, wave events, which is different from what's happening on the east coast. And so the wave events are highly dependent on local bathymetry. So that's coming from these distant storms as they make it up um, send their swell to the beach, the waves change based on what the, the ground is doing below it. And so <clears throat> obtaining data in this very shallow water environment um, can get a little bit difficult, not just because the water uh, is, well, you could do the airborne LIDAR kind of thing if the waves were calm, but that isn't always the case here. And um, so we're looking at uh, bathymetry in stuff that's less than about 10 meters or 30 feet of water depth. And um, that is pretty challenging. And traditionally, we, we go out and collect in situ data with um, jet skis and these push dollies. If you see crazy people walking into the waves with these contraptions here um, in the right pictures there. Um, so we've been doing that for about 20 years off the San Diego uh, coastline. But more recently, we've been moving into remote techniques. So that includes uh, truck and drone mounted LIDARs. 
And that allows us to get access to places that um, we've never observed before or places that are hard to access, especially um, with the drone LiDAR, we're, we're doing stuff to um, figure out what, get kind of bathymetry inversions and figure out what um, the, the waves look like or the, the water, sorry, the sand looks like underneath the water. Um, that's a region that's notoriously hard to um, get observations for. So next slide. So accurate bathymetric measurements, they improve our wave-induced flood forecasts, and that starts with regional bathymetry, and probably local, but we're bringing it closer to home here. So we start our total water level model in about 10 meters of water depth with a regional wave forecast model that's based off of the CDIP wave buoy network observations, as well as Wave Watch 3 forecasts. And then we model the forecasted waves onto our hyperlocal bathymetry. Um, and we have that historical bathymetry. And then the new techniques that we're using allow us to rapidly deploy our observing systems as we did in Imperial Beach with that, that first movie that you saw for model validation. Um, and in my opinion, that's sort of the, the necessary part to any forecast system is to make sure that it's correct. So you need to get your instruments out there um, to, to make sure that what you're forecasting is actually real. All right, next slide. So for more information on the uh, forecast model that we have, I encourage you to visit um, climateadapt.ucsd.edu. Um, that's the Center for Climate Change Impacts and Adaptation website. And if you advance there, I think it shows a preview of um, what you can find for the Imperial Beach forecast. That was part of the Resilient Futures project. Um, so the forecast tool down there is in the, the bottom left. and um, this is looking again at Imperial Beach. So you can see um, when we're predicted to have a flooding event. And then on the right-hand panel, you can see past events of flooding as well as um, bathymetric measurements that we've taken in that area. And um, that is all that I have for day today. So thank you very much. Look forward to hearing the questions. Th thank you, Julia. Okay, finally, last but, but certainly not least, uh, we have Mark uh, Gunderson. Mark is the president and CEO of Marine Advanced Robotics, Inc., and they're a manufacturer of marine robots. Mark. Great. Thank you, Larry. And um, I'm going to try to go through this pretty quickly um, just because I'm trying to pack in a lot of information. So next slide, please. So our company, Marine Advanced Robotics, is a San Francisco Bay Area-based uh, company. Um, our patented vessel technology is called WAMV, which stands for Wave Adaptive Modular Vessel. Um, next slide, please. So a little bit about the technology. Um, it's a scalable technology. We build, build them anywhere from two and a half meters up to 30 meters. Um, essentially, we're much like off-road vehicles, we treat waves like bumps. So by employing a suspension and articulation system, we're able to drastically reduce the motion at the central payload area, which is where we deploy sensors like multi-beam sonars, underwater robots, aerial vehicles, um, cameras, any sensor where you need stability um, in high sea states. The technology itself is modular, so you can quickly take it apart. You can quickly swap out parts, swap out payloads. It's designed to be uh, disassembled fast, boxed up and shipped uh, anywhere in the world. And it's also a very hydrodynamically efficient hull so that at the end of the day, you have you spend a lot less energy moving it through the water. Next slide, please. So I think for us to best kind of show you all a little bit of what we do and how the WAMB relates to hydrographic survey, I wanna run through a number of case studies. This one is, um, uh, for a WAMV-8, which is used by the U.S. Army dive teams. Um, they use it to do stuff like marine infrastructure inspections. You can quickly and easily launch it from a beach. You can launch it from a pier. Um, by using multi-beam sonar, LIDAR, they can get below the water. They can get above the water. And they can also use it in places like the USS Arizona Memorial, where they mapped uh, they mapped over the, over the USS Arizona. But a lot of versatility in the system. You can also pack it um, and take it as check baggage on a plane. Next slide, please. Um, another one, it's a coastal survey was for a cable landing survey um, off the coast of California. This was to map a corridor uh, coming into uh, a place in Northern California. 
Um, one of the things I want to point out here is that the WAMV was teamed up with crewed vessels as well. Um, and this kind of shows a little bit of the versatility of the system. The crewed vessels had to leave from a point in Northern California that was approximately 27 miles from the survey location. And the WAMV was able to launch at a much smaller facility that was only 12 miles from the survey location. Um, if we had had appropriate weather, we also could have launched it from the beach to, to map the cor corridor. And the WAMV was really tasked to map the uh, surf zone area. So, so, you know, high energy environment um, and we had to, you know, pull out the data they needed to, to map that corridor. Next slide, please. Another project we did was a force multiplier role on a NOAA project. This is where two WAMVs were teamed up with a crewed survey vessel. And one of the main uh, focuses of this, of this particular project was to bring all the survey data onto one instance of the acquisition software so you could see the coverage in real time, make adjustments as necessary. And then another focus was to bring on the assets without adding additional crew. And if we can go to the next slide, I'll show a quick video um, about this project. But again, you know, it's, it's really about lessening the burden on the person controlling the system. So whether the WAMBs are autonomously following the ship out or if you're towing it to a location, um, and then once you start the survey, you can make real-time adjustments quickly from the interface. Again, this is all the sonar data coming into one instance of the acquisition software, in this case, Quincy. This is the first time this has been done this way. Um, as you can imagine, it's very important when you're collecting this data. The last thing you want to do is bring you know, a bunch of sonar data together at the end of the day and realize you missed spots, right? You have all these holidays or that you had too much overlap. So the real-time adjustment makes it really easy to make those corrections as you're surveying and really shows the power of the um, force multiplier role. And then again, the WAMVs are great in adverse sea conditions, still get really high quality data, um, but you know, handle, handle the waves that are coming at it. Next slide, please. Uh, another one was a pipeline survey. So this is for a customer. Oh, sorry, there was supposed to be a um, video in there. But anyway, this one was uh, for a customer uh, that wanted to look at uh, surveying pipelines. So we have thousands of pipelines in the United States crossing the Mississippi, the Missouri, all the major rivers. And one of the problems is during a flooding event, um, these pipelines can have um, spans basically that are unsupported. And what was really interesting about this project was, and I didn't realize this, was during a flooding event, that bottom is changing on an hourly basis. So you could be, you could have zero spanning on a pipeline and four hours later have big, big spans across it. So it's really important for them to have accurate map or accurate projection or accurate pictures of the bottom so that they can know if they need to shut down a pipeline. And, and obviously shutting down a pipeline is a major decision and not one taken lightly. So having assets, unmanned assets out there to, to give that information is, is very critical. Next slide, please. So again, some of the advantages uh, to using on crude systems and specifically the WAMV is that it's a scalable technology. We can cover the inland water waterways out to um, open ocean. Stability of the platform, we prove this time and time again, you would get excellent data in all kinds of sea conditions with the stability, with the suspension system. Uh, the force multiplier role, uh, we see a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of advantages and, and you know, this we think is the wave of the future in terms of being able to leverage existing assets that are out there. In other words, the crewed vessels. By putting on, teaming up unmanned vessels with them, you're able to cover a lot of area uh, for reduced uh, price. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and that's it for me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mark. And I want to thank everybody. I think we've, we've, uh, we've seen a, uh, really a wonderful uh, array of new technologies that, that will help us uh, collect bathymetric data, data. We've seen some of the critical applications um, that bathymetric data provides, and I'd contend even for Dirk, who, who's making mostly biological observations, that having that geospatial context, having that context of the bathymetry may indeed provide some of the answers to why things are where they are. And so I, I, I think we've seen the pervasive uh, importance of, of uh, knowing bathymetry and, and, and uh, through, throughout everything we've heard. Now, I, I, I have a note that there, that there is a question. I don't see it appearing. Oh, here it is. Um, okay. And so the question has appeared. And uh, so I'll, I'll throw that out. And uh, 
How do your organizations convey your findings to each other and to the public? And maybe if we can just quickly, uh, one by one, go through the go through in the order you spoke. Start with David Miller. How do your how does your organization convey your findings to each other and to the public? Yeah. Okay. Thanks for the question. That's a good one. Uh, I would say traditionally we haven't been particularly good at this as a community and certainly as a uh, as a private sector, but uh, that's changing. Uh, and um, in the environment of the UN decade and, and CBED 2030, at least from a frugal perspective, um, we are uh, sh sharing data that we collect and own uh, to public sources such as JEBCO and, and CBED 2030 in the hydrographic uh, data context. Uh, and then we are also trying to encourage our customers who hire us to collect the information to share and make that data available that we've collected on their behalf as well. And there's been successes at, at getting those data into public uh, accessible sites as, as well. Thank you. Uh, we are a nonprofit, so we uh, typically provide our information to state and federal authorities with whom we work. Some of it is um, a little challenging in that when we find those large, large fish aggregations, uh, if they're in a fishable area, that is kind of the yellow brick road to where those animals are. So we try to keep, we try to dumb down the GPS coordinates for those, make them much more coarse so that um, smart um, fishermen are, are not going to take advantage of that. And then we uh, publish our findings not as regularly as we would like to. Uh, we're usually uh, kind of running from being on ships to back inshore, kind of crunching the data. So I think um, we also could do a better job of getting the results out there. Yeah, um, as, a, as a hydrographer, um, uh, it's, uh, it's the, by convention, we always have to share our findings that could represent a risk to navigation or to fishing trail industry, for instance. Uh, so any findings that, that could be reported on chart uh, has to be uh, reported to the local authorities. So that's as, uh, f f as a convention. Then um, as a survey company, most of our data collected belongs to our client. Uh, and what has changed since the last uh, few years with the CBET 2030, for instance, is that we, as a specialist, we tend to advise our client to share as, um, as much as possible, a different level of data uh, resolutions, for instance. If they have collected a meter um, resolution data, they could share a larger scale uh, data, for instance, for um, uh, local authorities or, uh, or, yeah, they, um, uh, or, or communities, yes. Julia. Um. Yeah, so, I mean, here in academia, the traditional route is you write papers and you get it out there. Um, but we do now have more of a public uh, interface with definitely with the website. And then we are sending this information to um, SCUS or the Southern California Coastal Observing System. And they help um, publicize this kind of stuff um, on their web page as well. So we are hopefully trying to do a good job of getting information out there, but we are always working on it. Mark? Yeah, so for us, it really depends on the uh, who the end customer is and what sort of restrictions are on the data. But a good example is on the, that NOAA project. Um, you know, once that data is turned over, it eventually ends up in a nautical chart and, and other ways like that. Yeah, and, and, and there are, there are um, federal databases, NCEI, uh, for, for certainly bathymetric and other data, and hopefully they're becoming more and more useful. Um, Another question has come in. What one thing would you ask? And I can't. Uh, there we go. Would you ask listeners to take away from your talk here? My Lord, <laughs> the, the one thing to, to ask uh, listeners to to take to take away talk very quickly because we we only have about a minute left total. David, sum it up. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I guess quickly is that uh, hydrography is becoming more affordable affordable because of these. Uh, enabling technologies and uh, probably more can be done with less um, in, in, the, in the future. So that's, uh, if it's maybe prohibitively expensive in the past, that may not be the case in the future. 
And, and I would add uh, the mapping needs to come first, but I think we really do need uh, inventories worldwide of what's, what's living down where. Capable to collect large uh, amount of data um, very quickly, we we need we would need a, a certain um, uh, governmental push <laughs> from all over the, the world. Uh, I, I know Europe is quite far behind from what the uh, United States is uh, is doing with NOAA, um, but uh, yeah, that's what what would be one thing for us. Observations are king. Validate, validate, validate. <laughs> yeah, and I agree. I agree with the, the uh, you know that these enabling technologies are going to give us um, a, a really tremendous way to collect a lot of data going forward. Um, the the little timer has run out run out of our session, so I, I don't know if that really really is the end of our session or not. Um, but I, I think. Um, you guys have done a, just a, a great job, and I think you, you've certainly enlightened folks to uh, the capabilities out there and the applications, and, uh, and uh, I hope that uh, the lessons that you summed up, that uh, hydrography is critical, it's getting cheaper, it's getting better, and observe and verify uh, are, are something that we'll, we'll all take home. Uh, so with that, I, I think uh, I will just... Uh, call this uh, session to an end and thank you all for your participation and uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Trulove and I'm a senior research technician at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. Thank you very much for joining us at our panel today of autonomy and eDNA. Our panel today has five speakers. Each speaker has five, is going to give a five minute talk and then the talk is going to be followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. And so I'd just like to start off by saying the field of environmental DNA, it's growing rapidly. It's being used more for research and conservation issues. And one of the major challenges we face right now is scaling it up to make it larger and more accessible. And I think autonomy is going to be one of the ways to go about meeting that challenge. And so I'd like to start off our talks without any further ado with um, Dr. Jeff Bowman from Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Thanks a lot, Jeff. All right, so um, this actually looks like a bit of an old slide deck. Um, my apologies. Can we go to the beginning? Okay, I'm, I'm <laughs> very sorry for that. Is there a way to switch to another speaker and I can get you an updated slide deck? This is uh, not quite the right thing. Very sorry for that. Yeah, I'd be happy to get started if that's easier since you had mine already going. All right, looks like it's going. I'm sorry for the wait there, everybody. So. I'm going to talk to you today about our research here at Ambari doing autonomous underwater collection and analysis of environmental DNA. Uh, next slide, please. So, Ambari is uh, located off the central coast of California, and we're fortunate to be right next to the Monterey um, Canyon, which is as deep as the Grand Canyon, and it's one of the areas where we do a lot of our research and development for autonomous vehicles and environmental DNA. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned earlier, eDNA has become increasingly important for research and conservation, and the techniques we're using with autonomy, we, we hope will be able to be useful for addressing these challenges in the future. Next slide, please. So, one of our major challenges is expanding our scope of research. So, as Mbari is just on the coast of California, we're also quite interested in conducting an environmental DNA research on a much larger scale to um, encompass the entire California current marine ecosystem. And we believe um, autonomous vehicles will be one of the paths to achieving this. Next slide, please. So at Ambari, we have a fleet of um, autonomous underwater vehicles that have been fitted with environmental sample processors. So we can guide these autonomous vehicles to locations of biological interest in the Monterey Bay Canyon, which I'll show you in a minute. And we can use the environmental sample processor, which you see below, to filter one liter of water and preserve those samples. And then we can bring those back to the lab for analysis. So next slide, please. So one of the areas that we've been actively researching in the Monterey Canyon is what we call MARS, which is the Monterey Accelerated Research Program. And we have a high-speed cable that's connected to an echo, sound, echo sounder that's moored at the bottom of this platform off the canyon. And I'll show you some of the data that we have in the next slide, please. So we're able to detect one of the largest uh, migrations on Earth, which happens when marine organisms migrate up to the surface from deep waters at night. And you can see this kind of oscillation of their migration over time. And we're quite interested to see if we can also be using eDNA to kind of pick up signatures of this migration. So next slide, please. So what would happen, for example, if we were sampling during the day at the surface when a lot of the fish were down deep? And conversely, if we sampled at night at the surface when the fish were up at the surface. So next slide. And so by using our autonomous vehicles, we can guide those vehicles to um, locations um, 
that the echo sounder can tell us where the highest amount of biomass is available, and then we can then collect our water samples in those specific locations. Next slide, please. And how we've traditionally been doing this analysis is by using ship-based surveys, um, deploying NISCAN bottles to where the areas of biological activity are located and, and um, collecting water samples that way. And so what we've been um, actively testing is comparing how does the environmental sample process collect samples compare to samples that are you know, traditionally collected off of ship-based surveys. Next slide, please. And so, um, the main one, of, the main difference too for that um, type of sampling is what happens on board the what happens on board the autonomous vehicle can also be um, put into what you see below the autonomous vehicle on the bottom right hand panel is kind of our what we call kind of the tackle box setup. So you can also set up this autonomous sampling um, platform to be taken to other locations as well. So it can be either mounted inside the autonomous vehicle, or it could also be taken to streams and freshwater environments as well, which I'll show you in some slides later. And then what we've been doing traditionally is we sample off of the ship using those Niskin bottles, and then we take the water out of those bottles and filter it through a 0.2 micron membrane using a peristaltic pump setup. Next slide, please. And so when we compared these data, um, this study by Yamahara and colleagues that was published in recently in Frontiers in Marine Science found similar correlations between the environmental sample processor samples and samples that were that were um, processed manually using um, qPCR markers. Uh, next slide, please. And some of the work that I've been working on has been using metabarcoding approach as well. So we use the 12S metabarcoding primers, which target um, vertebrates, and we found similar trends across depth. If you can um, move to the next slide, please, just to highlight those differences in depth. And we also found differences in season as well. So we found the same trends in community structure using um, traditional collected samples and also samples that were collected autonomously. Next slide, please. So those, there you go. So there it's showing kind of highlighting the depth differences and the previous slide was kind of highlighting the seasonal differences in community structure. Uh, next slide, please. And we're also using Oxford nanopore sequencing as well. So we want to try to speed up the amount of time it takes to process metabarcoding samples. So we've been developing kind of rapid eDNA sequencing technologies. So we've also been focusing on this, what we call C1, which is the kind of the site that's closest to where we're located, um, just right kind of the opening at the Monterey Bay Canyon. So we've been collecting water there. Next slide, please. And then we've been um, working on a pipeline that goes from to, Using the ES, using the environmental sample processor to rapidly um, extract that DNA, and then we've been processing it in the lab um, and sequencing it um, using the MinION sequencer, and then using bioinformatics to get us our um, species identifications of what animals are present in the water column. And going through this whole process now is taking us about a day to go from filtered water to um, species identifications. Next slide, please. And as I mentioned previously, the way we have the environmental sample processor set up, it can also go into this tackle box setup where you can take it to freshwater applications as well. And, um, and this is my last slide coming up, please. And it can also be attached to be um, autonomously sampling in remote applications with a, with a small solar panel array. And um, you can, so you can come back a week later, pick up your samples and also have your data. So thank you all very much for your time. And yeah, look forward to the next round of talks coming up. All right, thank you. So uh, many thanks to IT for getting me sorted out there. So I'm just going to spend a few minutes giving perspectives on eDNA analysis. And the first point that I want to bring up is that eDNA analysis is best used in a comprehensive format. Um, the ideal sampling and analysis pipeline should include viruses and phage, microbes including the bacteria and the phytoplankton, all the way up through metazoans. We shouldn't be thinking those, these as distinct analytical targets. Um, the next point I want to bring up is that eDNA is a sensitive meta-indicator of ecosystem change. Um, it's very useful for identifying specific species, uh, for example, for conservation missions, but I think that overlooks its key value, which is this meta-indicator of ecosystem change. 
As we just heard from Nathan, autonomy can optimize sample collection and minimize cost. This is going to be a major uh, 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 design trend moving forward. And then the last point, looking further forward into the future, I would really like to push this community to think about autonomous full ocean sampling as a realistic goal in a 20-year time scale. Nothing magic about that 20-year window, but I think that that's when the technology is really going to converge to get us out there where we're looking at eDNA in the ocean in real time on a global scale. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the animation on this slide isn't uh, moving, uh, unfortunately, but uh, what you would see here if it was, was the evolution of microbial communities over time for marine samples into treatments. Now, as this graphic would be moving forward, you would be seeing um, the community uh, described in a two-dimensional space um, moving and evolving over time. And the size of the circles here indicates how a geochemical parameter relates to that microbial community. And as that microbial community evolved, you would see the geochemistry evolving along with it. Now, what this means is that the microbial community in this system is a really strong indicator of that particular geochemical parameter. Um, we're looking at a very specific system here where we know that the chemistry is being produced by, by the marine microbe, but I would hypothesize that we can expand this idea and think about many different geochemical parameters that can be actually predicted by the microbial community or by other communities that can be analyzed via eDNA analysis. What we're doing now is using machine learning techniques to actually predict um, ecological state and geochemistry with really surprisingly high fidelity within marine systems. Next slide, please. So in order to do this, you really need big sample numbers. Um, now, if that graphic had been moving, you would have seen that community evolving and the sample numbers would have really kind of emerged from the scale of that analysis. It took hundreds of samples to build up a good uh, machine learning uh, model that can predict the geochemistry from the microbial community. So you really are looking for hundreds to thousands of samples to really understand what a given plot in the marine environment or a given time course in the marine environment is doing. Uh, fortunately for us, the analysis costs for eDNA have really come down. We've got an informal goal in our lab of getting down to about $5 per sample. Right now we're currently at $15 and that's all in, including the, the reagents and the filters up front, going all the way through the, the sequencing. And even though this is well above our goal, this is a pretty good number. This is roughly on parity with the cost of analyzing, for example, dissolved inorganic nutrients. If you wanted to know how much nitrate or phosphate was in your sample, it would cost about the same as understanding the full suite of uh, microorganisms and larger organisms that, be, that can be analyzed via eDNA. Um, now, one place that we're doing this um, is on the Scripps Pier. The Scripps Pier is shown uh, here in this illustration. Uh, we have a long-term uh, time series going on at the Scripps Pier where we monitor the microbial community. Uh, the analysis of the 16S and 18S are RNA genes. Um, you can see some plots of how those communities evolve in a seasonal sense over on the right. Next slide, please. Now, the Scripps Pier offers a wonderful opportunity to explore different hardware solutions to this autonomy problem. And one key advantage to using autonomy in a situation like this is that it allows you to maximize the information that you get from sampling the environment. So what you're looking at here is just a, a random uh, uh, couple day period from July, and you're looking at the temperature at the Scripps Pier that's given by the blue line here. And we can see that this is not a very static environment. It's quite dynamic. There are these major temperature excursions that are taking place as different physical features impact the pier. So for example, as internal waves that are tidally driven or driven by other physical processes come through, there are these temperature excursions um, uh, as, as the water cools. Now, if you send somebody out on the pier to sample, say, every 24 hours, you may or may not capture um, these types of features. You really don't know what's going to happen at the time that you're out there sampling. We want to learn how to sample in a more intelligent fashion so that we can get the time points that provide us the information that we actually need. And the red lines here indicate uh, just uh, one algorithm that allows us to do that. And it's picking out certain time points to fire an autonomous sampling system such that we're capturing those points that are going to give us the most information. Next slide, please. And uh, here's just some photographs of the hardware that we're developing to actually do this. Um, our goal is a low cost, very scalable, open source um, platform for doing this type of work, for doing this intelligent sampling of the environment based on external 
um, uh, features that can be sent in a continuous fashion. And uh, really what we have here is just a filtration manifold that's being driven um, by a pumping system that responds to external stimuli from the environment. So when it senses that the environment is changing, it can initiate a sampling routine in response to that. Next slide, please. And then I'd like to end again with that challenge of can we get to an autonomous full ocean sampling for eDNA analysis on something like a 20 year time scale? I think that should be this community's goal. And just one inspiration for that, I'd point here to the Argo array. Um, this is a really ambitious effort to understand the physics of the ocean, looking at temperature and salinity. They've got a huge uh, fleet of floats out there, thousands of floats out there. Um, autonomously sampling uh, the upper ocean and um, moving towards the deep ocean as well. There are a smaller subset of floats out there that are capable of looking at the biogeochemistry of that environment as well. Now, of course, doing global eDNA autonomous sampling isn't going to be as simple as bolting a nanopore sequencer to an Argo float or something like that. We need platforms that are designed from the ground up to handle the power and the, and the data and the communications. But I think that we can get there on a 20 year time scale. And I would just like to spend a moment thinking about how wonderful it would be to have real time eDNA sampling from every single one of these yellow points that's on this plot, which is not the full Argo fleet by uh, any, any measure. It's just the floats that have reported in during a 72 hour period on a recent week. Uh, thank you very much. Well, that, yeah, that was excellent. Thanks a lot, Jeff. So we'd like to move on to our next speaker, Annette uh, Govindarajan from Woods Hole Institute. Thank you very much, Annette. Thanks. I, <laughs> yep, thanks for the introduction. Um, I'm Annette Govindarajan. I'm a biologist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, and I'm part of our Ocean Twilight Zone project, which is a large privately funded endeavor to study the ocean's mesopelagic zone, and that's the region between 200 and 1,000 meters depth. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So our OTZ project has several theme areas to study the biodiversity, biomass, and other aspects of the ecology and ecosystem services of this region. And so um, I'm working as part of the, the biodiversity theme area, which is using environmental DNA to uh, identify uh, the um, inhabitants of this region. And so uh, we're working with our uh, technology partners to develop autonomous eDNA sampler to, that we can utilize on different platforms. And so I just want to acknowledge my colleagues, uh, Dana Yerger, he's a senior scientist in the Applied Ocean Physics and Engineering Department, and Alan Adams is a scientist at MIT. And those are the, the, the two that I'm working with to develop uh, and, and deploy uh, these eDNA samplers. So um, next slide, please. So that's sort of the typical way uh, that, that we would get samples, uh, water samples for uh, environmental DNA would be when we go to sea, we use the Niskin vials, which I, I think someone else also mentioned before. So you put the bottles and, and then they uh, trigger to close shut at a desired depth. And then you bring those back to the ship and then you filter the water for the eDNA on the ship. And then those can then be brought back to the lab for the, the downstream processing. So what we're doing with our uh, with the our eDNA sampler is to move the, the filtration um, uh, and the collection as well as the filtration to be in situ so uh, that it would take the sample and, and filter the water uh, at, the, at the desired depth on, on different platforms. And this has some several advantages uh, in terms of um, um, reducing avenues for contamination. eDNA is a very sensitive uh, approach use, that looks at you know, very trace quantities of DNA. So if we can reduce the number of steps involved, that, that uh, improves our data. Um, it also allows for uh, in increased flexibility in our, our sampling design and also saves time. So next slide, please. So we have uh, developed samplers to put on uh, some of our platforms. We've got Deep Sea, which is a towed acoustic broadband uh, uh, broadband acoustic and, and imaging uh, instrument developed by Andoni Lavery. And we also have Mezabot, which is a new hybrid um, imaging and, and tracking vehicle for, for the midwater. And so we have, um, I'd like to show you our eDNA sampler on the Mezabot, which is on our next slide, please. And so, uh, so this is Mezabot on, and the sampler is on the sort of bottom payload section there. And this is a picture taken on our, its uh, second deployment, which was 
in March, just right before the, the pandemic shut down. And so our sampler consists of two uh, pumps with uh, filter holder assemblies developed by Amy Kakulia. And so we can take a total of right now up to, to 12 samples. Uh, the filters holders contain uh, pre-sterilized encapsulated uh, filters that allow us to do the filtration in situ. We can control the volume, you know, anywhere from small volumes, less than a liter to, you know, as much as you want, you know, 100 liters or more, if that's what you would want. But in any case, we have um, now deployed our sampler successfully on, on, on Mezabot on two cruises. The first one uh, on the RV Manta in the Gulf of Mexico in September. Uh, 2019 with our colleagues uh, Santiago Herrera and Jill McDermott from Lehigh. And then again, um, the second deployment on the RV Armstrong in the Northwest Atlantic, and that was uh, in March, uh, just before the shutdown. So um, so we're looking forward to continuing to um, deploy and, and analyze the, the samples from these deployments. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, thank you very much, Annette. And now we're going to move on to our, our next speaker, Jerry Mollison. So thank you very much for joining us, Jerry. My pleasure. Okay, so this talk's gonna be a little bit different. Um, I promised to tie it back into eDNA at, eDNA at the end, but um, in all honesty, I kind of considered autonomy and eDNA to be separate topics, trying to tie them into the sustainable development goals, uh, 12, responsible consumption production, and SDG 14, life below the water. Uh, just a couple of quick points. Um, referring back, uh, Nathan showed an early picture of the dial migration of the biomass. Um, I work for Teledyne RDI, and I want to talk more about enabling the wonderful research that uh, you folks out there are doing. Um, not so much trying to lead the research as to help make it happen. Um, to that end, um, some of the backscatter original work was done um, off of ADCP data, looking at the signal strength. Um, we looked at the old narrow bands with uh, Charlie Flagg and Sharon Smith in the 80s, and the broad bands with Mark Benfield and others in the 90s, um, basically trying to rearrange the sonar equation where you're basically originally trying to determine the SNR to the target, but if you rearrange it, you can get an estimate of the volumetric volumetric backscatter. So after you've accounted for all the other variables, that can give you some estimate of the, the uh, quantity of biomass or sediment that's out in the water column. The other thing I wanted to talk about was autonomy. And um, Annette referenced uh, Dana Yerger. He has one of my favorite quotes, which is that a subsea vehicle that doesn't know its location has extremely limited use. So one of the things that we do at RDI is uh, we build the DVLs that help you guys know um, where the platforms are when they gather the data, particularly the ones that are operating autonomously. And uh, lastly, we also make ADCPs for currents, and uh, that's how I'm going to tie it back into eDNA at the end. So if I can go to the next slide, please. So what I'm doing here basically is going through most of this stuff. It has a lot more detail on the teledimarine.com URL located at the top. I just want to hit some of the high points of some of the research that's being tied back into these SDGs that I mentioned earlier. Um, George Waters, who's uh, with the Antarctic Ecosystem Research Division at NOAA Fisheries, um, he's basically using uh, Slocum gliders that has sonars equipped at three different frequencies to count krill out in the Antarctic waters, obviously krill being the basis of a large part of the food chain, particularly for the charismatic um, animals that are out there. He's showing good results compared to previous data from research vessels, but the main point here is that he can field multiple gliders for a longer period of time than he could be down there in a research vessel. Also, he likes to point out that um, he gets to pilot the gliders from San Diego rather than Antarctica, so the weather's a little bit more, plus, more pleasant for him. Going on to Richard Valley, who's with InnovaSea, he's actually using fish tags that have sonar transponders on them, uh, monitored by uh, Teledyne Benthos modems. These modems are deployed fixed, for example, in a habitat where they want to know, you know, how often are the tagged fish coming to this area, um, or they can be put on gliders. Um, and have been put on gliders to uh, gather the data while the researcher is not there. He's done this from liquid robotics wave gliders uh, that have surface and subsurface expression, so they can be in constant radio contact or satellite contact, and also with uh, slocum, wave gl slocum gliders, which pop up to the surface every once in a while and report in what they're doing. Uh, next slide, please. 
So a lot of work in the whale monitoring and fisheries. Um, Jude Vondemer, uh, who's a glider technician at Dalhousie, he's got uh, Slocum gliders flying around out in the uh, North Atlantic and the um, St. Lawrence. Uh, basically, they've got a special package on there developed at Hui where they have several recorded whale calls. Hydrophones are listening continuously, and when they hear a whale that, or identify a whale, they radio in that they found one, and an expert then looks at it to decide if it was really, really was a whale. But uh, that's important because it gives more timely information to the vessel traffic in the area and also to the fisheries, which are heavily impacted, particularly by the right whales which are down to, I believe, about 400 species now, and there's a huge effort to try and keep those guys alive and on the recovery path. Uh, let's see, Captain Richard Riles is uh, with SMELTS, um, and SMELTS, in case you're curious, I was, is Sea Mammal Education Learning Technology Society. So it's a bit of a stretch for an acronym, but, but it works. And he's basically trying to get rid of the vertical ropes because those are known to trap whales, particularly the right whales. These are the vertical ropes that uh, have the buoys where the lobster fishermen, the crab fishermen, even some of the gill nets, where these guys can go back and recover their gear. So his idea is, well, let's, let's get rid of that vertical rope. It's entangling the whales. So what we can do instead is use benthos gear in order to um, send a, put, a, put a lift bag down there and use benthos gear to release air into the bag and pull the traps to the surface. Um, right now, unfortunately, this faces regulatory hurdles, hurdles because believe it or not, that vertical rope rope is required by the fisheries licensing agency. So he's trying to get that changed. Next slide. And now we're going to go to mesophotic reefs. These are the reefs that are um, basically a little too deep for technical diving, or excuse me, for non-technical diving. So these are down 30, 60 meters deep, uh, mesophotic mean, uh, meaning uh, low light. Um, Dr. Art Trumbaris at the University of Delaware um, he's trying to map out the, uh, the extent of the reefs as part of the habitat necessary for or start part of the data necessary for studying the habitat and the bio and the fisheries that are there. Um, he's using a, a Teledyne Gavia glider to actually go out and survey these reefs um, because, as I said, they're too deep to send divers and uh, also too deep to really get the results you kind of want from a surface vessel, plus a, a, a AUV is going to be cheaper to work. And then lastly, I can circle it back into eDNA finally, and that's Tim Noyes. And what he's doing specifically uh, I should manage, he's, he's a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Salford in the UK. What he's doing specifically, he's working on lionfish eradication efforts. Um, lionfish are an invasive species on some of these mesophotic reefs, um, and they're incredibly uh, voracious predators, so they're trying to keep them under control. And what he's been doing is he's been looking for eDNA to uh, track basically how well the lionfish eradication efforts are going. Um, he's looking at a particular reef um, out off of Bermuda. And what he's been doing recently is he's going, okay, I've got the eDNA, but I want to know where's it coming from, where's it going? So he's put an ADCP down there over this last testing cycle because um, he wants to know, um, as Jeff was pointing out, how the currents, the internal waves, and so forth and so on, the tides might be affecting the distribution of the eDNA. Um, he's using this ADCP to try and uh, figure that out. Where's the eDNA coming from? Where's it going to? He also was interested in hoping, because it's Bermuda, because huge current events that might happen are hurricanes. So he deployed the currents, hoping that one would hit his area, and, and he was fortunate enough, from his perspective, to have two hit him. Uh, don't want to reveal anything on the data yet, and uh, like everyone else, we're looking forward to seeing his results. Thank you. Great. Yeah, th thank you very much, Jerry. And we have um, Evan Taylor, who will give our final talk, and then we'll be followed by a question and answer session. So thank you very much, Evan. Thank you, Nathan. And Jerry, thank you for transitioning to technology that can enhance eDNA analysis, because that's what I'm going to talk about um, as soon as the slides start. Here we go. Uh, my name is Evan Taylor. I work at Burge Environmental. We are a five-person research and development company based out of Tempe, Arizona. We have won 20 or 25 Department of Energy or Department of Defense SBIR awards in our 25-year history to develop sensor technology. Uh, for environmental sensing applications. Uh, next slide. The MyProbe is a new kind of microbial sensor technology. Uh, essentially, we use a inert graphite electrode as a surface for endemic species of microbes to populate. And then we measure the electron activity within that biofilm on our sensor surface to understand the environment from the perspective of the my 
microbes that are living in it. We can see changes in redox, changes in photosynthesis, biomass, nutrient loading, anything that really is a biological process in the environment, we're able to see kind of like an EKG would see a heart murmur or high blood pressure effects on a person. Uh, next slide. Uh, recently, we heard with the Arizona State University's uh, AZ Caddy. Uh, they tried out our sensor technology a few years ago, and we didn't think it would work in uh, algae at all. But what we discovered was that the microbial sensor is a composite signal that is able you're able to discern using very basic statistical analysis methods. You don't need machine learning or AI for this to observe in real time what's going on. Uh, we see diurnal patterns from photosynthesis, but the increase in the daily variance correlates very strongly with the increase in biomass. And you can see there's an overall trend that also correlates very strongly with biomass. So as AZ Caddy was comparing their biomass from this algae raceway, uh, we just take a daily average and you can see we've got, you know, very high correlation with that. But also when we thought our sensor technology wasn't working, it was in fact AZ Caddy had detected a few weeks later a chytrid contaminant uh, killing their, mic um, their algae and impacting the photosynthesis. You can see that on the bottom right. So essentially this EKG can give you more information about what's going on within your sort of biological community or microbial community in a aquatic environment, and it can do so within a few hours. Uh, we're looking at detecting pond crashes with AZ Caddy on a Department of Energy research grant over the next three years. We're hoping to be able to do it within four to six hours. Currently, it takes four to five days, and that's with daily expensive lab sampling that I think everyone else here is pretty familiar with. Uh, next slide. Uh, after looking at and constantly seeing crashes and other toxic impacts in wastewater applications and potable water applications, we ended up doing an experimental setup to see, can we observe toxic metals impacting the microbes? And it wasn't so much interesting to see that, yes, we see the response to uh, this um, cocktail of various uh, heavy metals, but the area under the dimension curve has a perfectly linear correlation with the concentration of toxic injected. If we go to the next slide. So we were very excited to see this, that the behavior of the probe in these environments uh, constantly gives you better insights as, as to what's going on immediately. And you don't necessarily have to uh, try to use like pond forensics or any type of uh, long lead time lab analyses to go, okay, I have a problem. So now we're using this technology in wastewater applications where wastewater treatment systems, will, uh, plants will go sample when there's a problem. Uh, next slide. Uh, more recently, in conjunction with AZ Caddy and ASU, we're looking at deploying additional systems throughout the Central Arizona Project Potable Water Canal. We're able to use it for uh, algae bloom detection, but the results have been pretty good thus far, and we're looking at deploying in the next year and a half uh, all 300 plus miles of canal system for monitoring. Next slide. Uh, Basically, we use open source software to do everything here. We make this technology available for researchers. It's easier for you know, operators and people on the business side and operation side to just look at real-time dashboards. But with researchers such as yourselves or, uh, and our other uh, collaborators, we give them direct access to all, the, all of the data using whatever advanced analysis tool they're using, such as Jupyter Notebook. Um, Jeff explained earlier the importance of real-time data. We now have a way of looking at the environment perspective of the life in it, and we can see the changes to that environment and how they may impact the changes in species that come in and the analysis we can do with DNA. Next slide. Here's just an example schematic figure of our current system, and if uh, anyone's interested in collaboration or other opportunities, please reach out. Thank you. Great. Well, yeah. Thank you very much, Evan. That, that was an that was an excellent talk. So, um, yeah. If, if there's anyone who's watching now who would like to ask any questions, um, please enter that in the chat box. And yeah, I would just like to um, start off um, with a with a question for Jeff. I really liked your last slide about kind of scaling up to um, 
using EDNN, all the Argos floats on kind of a global program, um, and how we've all been talking about autonomous vehicles playing an important role in that. I think, there, like you said, it's not as easy as just slapping on a nanopore sequencer. I mean, what would you, in your vision, what would you say some of the first steps would be in moving towards that goal? Yeah, thanks. That's a, a really great question. And uh, one thing that I, I want to be really cautious of is as we move forward and develop these really ambitious technologies, we do have to be sensitive to the profound success of the existing technologies and not endanger them. And so I want to make a, a very key distinction that um, we have to protect core programs such as Argo, but at the same time, we have to then build something new that can achieve our missions. And so Argo is very tightly optimized to doing temperature and salinity, and they've got everything dialed down in terms of their power requirements and float lifetime. So we have to look forward and think of our own platforms and our own technologies that will enable that without endangering the highly successful existing technologies. So from my perspective, um, you know, a lot of the work that was talked about today is talking about kind of the front end systems. You've got the sampling problem. And so lots of us are looking around at different solutions to the sampling problem. There are all kinds of interesting ways to concentrate water, to collect biomass out of water. And a lot of the technologies that we saw today are focusing on different aspects of that. Then you've got your wet chemistry part. Then you've got your sequencing. Then you've got your data. And right now we're still at a phase where we are trying to make headway in all of those four areas somewhat independently. Um, and pretty soon we're going to have to start to converge a little bit and see how to start to bolt together these different pieces of these platforms into ways that can enable scalable, lightweight, low power, long lifetime systems. And that's a really tall order, but that's kind of where we have to go to. So I see kind of five more years of optimizing those four parts independently, followed by about 15 years of really hard learning to optimize all of them together into integrated systems. We have a question coming on screen. So yeah, the question is, um, what mechanisms exist to help overcome regulatory hurdles and update policies? Yeah, it's quite a good question. Uh, uh, sheer force of will. <laughs> So, well, so this is very hard. I actually, that. sorry, go ahead, Jerry. Sorry. I was just going to say um, one of the particular ones that we've been looking at here is uh, Captain Richard Riles, who's trying to um, basically get rid of the vertical rope if the vertical rope is causing the problems. Right now, what the fisheries do is say, well, if the whales are in the area, you can't fish. Um, so trying to do sustainable production. Um, he's basically working with uh, uh, National Marine Fisheries uh, you, you basically just have to navigate the system, you get lobbyists, uh, work through the federal government, work with fisheries and try and make it happen. It's a, it's an, I can make point. a quick, well, if I can make a quick additional comment on that, that was a, a, a really nice response. Um, I think one thing we have to be careful of here is we don't yet know fully what the eDNA technologies and data can do for us, uh, particularly in the regulatory or conservation space. And so I think we have to be a little bit careful to not get too far ahead in terms of what can the technology provide to the regulators before we know what that data can provide. And you know, in, in the next couple of years, I think we'll have a really good sense of what eDNA type analyses can provide that might be useful for regulatory settings. But we have to be a little bit careful about knowing, uh, proving the technology before we make that jump. Uh. To answer the question about testing in the ocean, um, we're based out of Arizona, so that's been a little bit of logistical hardship. Uh, last year, uh, we ended up partnering with a uh, energy recovery technology that we uh, group that we met at this conference and going after an SBIR for them to integrate our sensors with their um, platform for aquatic environments. We ha at uh, AZ Caddy we are tested in sa highly saline algae cultivation basins, but really we, we're looking at collaborative partnerships on research. We're a very small company and we are not focused on ocean applications. So we're looking for institutes to work with who might want to play with the technology in ocean environments.
Oh, thank you. Oh, sorry, my mic was muted. Thank you all, everybody. It was, yeah, it was a really great session and really enjoyed everyone's talk. And yeah, hope we can all um, stay in contact after this and be great to hear more about everyone's research. Welcome everyone to the TMA Blue Tech session on philanthropy's role in ocean observations. I think you know how important ocean observations are if you're here at Blue Tech. But what I would remind you is if you like your seven day weather, thank an oceanographer and thank the people who bring you this technology. Well, I hope we're going to have an engaging discussion here with philanthropy's role in ocean observations. And I'm very much looking forward to our panel's comments. We're going to first hear from Erica Montague who is the chief technologist for the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners. 
And that's part of a very large enterprise that you're probably well familiar with in terms of, of the Schmidt contribution to ocean science at many different levels. But technology partners, you'll hear a little bit more about, but that's an opportunity to find new and budding technologies and to support them with investment and ripen them into maturity and market availability. Next, we'll hear then from Alexis Valuri Orton, and Alexis is a program officer at the Ocean Foundation. Once again, a very familiar scene, a familiar player in the scene. And here, Alexis leads the Ocean Acidification Network, and we're very proud of the work that the Ocean Foundation has done to bring observations into focus in a very logical and obvious application in the concerning situation we find with the acidification of oceans. And then we have Jason Thompson. Jason is the Chief Technology Officer of Ocean Kind. And Ocean Kind is a relatively new, but very much on the scene and present, family-based foundation that looks to find radical changes in ocean environmental challenges and bring about solutions. So all of this to me is a very nice balance in the panel where we've got technology purveyors, an opportunity for the viewers and the participants in TMA Blue Tech Week here to be seeing where investment opportunities, leveraging and new technologies might be found. So to get started, I'm gonna offer Erica the floor and Erica, Please proceed. We're looking forward to your remarks. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Craig, for that introduction. Uh, so as Craig mentioned, I'm with Schmidt Marine Technology Partners. Uh, we are based out of San Francisco. Uh, next slide, please. So we are part of a much larger entity. Uh, Schmidt has many different organizations. Um, some of them you may have heard of, such as our sister institute, Schmidt Ocean Institute, whom we work closely with. They actually give funding for researchers to go out to sea aboard their ship Falcor. There's also the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Strategic Innovation and Schmidt Futures. But we are housed under the entity Schmidt Family Foundation, which also holds the 11th Hour Project and the 11th Hour Racing Team, whom we work closely with. Uh, our program specifically looks at developing early stage ocean technology. Next slide, please. We do this through grant making, and our primary mission is to really identify and fund those early stage ocean technologies that have some sort of benefit to the environment and have potential towards commercialization. The next slide. However, this is not our only mission. Our secondary mission is really to broaden out the conversation to bring on multiple stakeholders into this place, help with collaborations, from different fields um, and also increase the funding uh, because we are just one entity involved in this uh, type of effort. Next slide, please. So why are we doing this? Well, we identified about six years ago when we started that there appeared to be this overwhelming uh, problem with funding in the space, most specifically in these early stages of ocean technology that seemed to be sequestered within academia, not-for-profits or early stage startups, uh, that they lacked the funding to really be able to get over this, um, what we call trench of death instead of value of death, and onto the next stage where they could actually get investment and make impact. Um, so turning from these idea stages, so something from a technology readiness level of a, of a one to three, and getting it really to a stage of a TRL um, eight or nine, where they could really take on that early stage investment. And so we chose to do this through grant making um, where we fund these and we don't fund them for a year. We fund them for the first year and then multi-year until we can see these um, groups advance into the placement where uh, investors will have some interest in taking them on board. Next slide, please. When we formed this, we decided to focus on four key areas. Um, these are likely to evolve over time, but these are the areas that we found would be most um, in need of funding. It seems you might need to advance for the rest of this to show up. Thank you. So the first one was sustaining fisheries. Uh, that's really looking at technologies that can improve transparency in the seafood supply chain or reduce bycatch. Uh, next one, please. Also enabling ocean research. So these are the kinds of technologies that many people are coming up with that are really exciting, but maybe it's just something that their laboratory is using, whereas it could be very valuable for many researchers out in that space. So trying to get these technologies out in the hands of many for broader applications. Next, please. 
and habitat health. So this is any kind of improvement tech. It can be low tech or high tech. We've funded both uh, to really sort of improve that environment. Next, please. And finally, plastics. And when we first looked at this sector, uh, there wasn't much funding happening in um, technology around plastics related to the ocean. Now, a lot of the technology that we focus on is very far upstream. So that might be um, better recycling technologies or um, other types of means for um, plastic, virgin plastic. Uh, next, please. And as I mentioned, we do this through grant making. We also do contracts. And finally, we do have an overarching investment program that supports the foundation as a whole, which we are part of. Next slide, please. Oh, keep going. I seem to have old, <laughs> loaded an old deck. You can move to these next four very quickly. My apologies on this one. And next slide. Thank you. So currently, we are funding over 48 projects in six countries, 13 different states. By the end of this year, in our final grant review, we intend to have over 50 projects. Uh, at least seven countries and several more states. Uh, so it's pretty exciting. This has happened over six years. We got rolling pretty slowly in the first year or two. So this has rapidly accelerated over the last several years. And we continue to see this program growing both in the number of grantees that we have and the amount of funding that we have to provide. Next slide, please. So in addition to those four buckets I mentioned earlier, we also put together a coastal pollution challenge last year with the idea of specifically looking at technologies that could identify solutions around um, nutrient pollution, nitrogen. Uh, next, please. So we, we identified a few categories. One of them was coastal habitat, any kind of infrastructure that could mitigate nitrogen input. Uh, next, please. In addition to looking at things like biochar that actually could remove or draw down nitrogen, um, sequestering it from getting into the marine environment to begin with. Next, please. And finally, low cost sensors, which is not new to us. Many people have had low cost sensor uh, challenges, uh, but we were really looking for a very low cost nitrogen sensor that would be under $1,000. And our winners, we had four. Um, one of them was actually co-funded by another anonymous group, which was part of our desire to bring on other funders, and that was Station C, soon to be called Oceanic Labs, from Alan Adams, formerly out at MIT, uh, to develop a low-cost nutrient sensor. Um, also, Amy Miller's lab out of Northeastern is doing a nutrient sensor. Finally, we had Mango Materials, which is actually creating um, microbial mesh netting uh, that will draw down um, microbes uh, that digest the nutrients and takachar, which is identifying uh, biochar production in many regions. Next, please. As I mentioned, we really tried to get the word out there and create more events where more people can attend. And we were thrilled to have our technology showcase uh, last year, 2019, actually this month, it seems so long ago. Uh, and we highlighted 15 of our grantees at this event. We're absolutely thrilled to see the diversity of people that came, um, both investors and also other groups that were interested in funding and working within the space. Next slide, please. So we encourage you to reach out. We really want to network with many different kinds of groups, both groups that are seeking funding and groups that are uh, able to provide funding in the space. Thank you. Back to you, Craig. Erica, thank you very much. I found it interesting to hear your characterization that in just six years, you've accomplished that much and you felt that it was a slow start. I want to get back to that later as we deal with philanthropies that might be new and emerging. So we'll turn now to a, a foundation that's been around for quite some time and well-practiced in the field. And we'll move over to Alexis for her discussion and acquaintance for us with the Ocean Foundation. So Alexis, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit about the Ocean Foundation's work in addressing essentially inequities in ocean science capacity and, and how we do that as a community foundation. Next slide, please. 
So as I mentioned, the Ocean Foundation is a community foundation and we are the only community foundation for the ocean. A community foundation is a public foundation. It's not um, associated with a, a family and it's more common in the United States than in other places. Some of the more famous community foundations include the New York Community Trust or the Seattle Foundation, essentially pooling philanthropic support for a community. And for us, that community is the ocean and uh, we were founded in 2003 really because there wasn't very much philanthropic funding going towards the ocean and we wanted to mobilize more next slide please we in our 17 year history have given out about 60 million dollars uh, in grants and services and we categorize it in four general buckets focused on conservation species protection uh, awareness and education and then also capacity development and i primarily focus in that last bucket uh, capacity development next slide please uh, we offer many different services as a community foundation in addition to pooling funds and uh, providing direct grants we also offer something called fiscal hosting where we essentially lend our 501c3 nonprofit status to basically um, startup NGOs, if you will. We're essentially an incubator for ocean NGOs. And so uh, we actually fiscally host more than 50 projects all over the world, um, everything ranging from sea turtle genetics to education. And so when you combine sort of our fiscal hosting with our grant making and the work that we do in house, we are working across all seven continents and in over 40 countries. And we really pride ourselves on directly supporting people on the ground. So, you know, driving funding and support to the smaller scale projects that are on the ground. Next slide, please. So on today's topic, um, thinking about the role of philanthropy in ocean observing, I first wanted to put a thought out there about how philanthropy can advance ocean observing, help it expand beyond where it currently exists. And one of the big problems right now is the unequal distribution in the ocean observing assets, but also who manages those. There's not only regions of the ocean that are underobserved, but much of those assets are really owned and operated by a small subset of countries. And philanthropic organizations are really well positioned to kind of fill these gaps um, by directly supporting groups on the ground. Next slide, please. So then what about sustaining that ocean observing, right? It's one thing to kind of get assets into new areas, but we all know that long-term monitoring really requires infrastructure and, and in particular federal funding, right? A dedicated federal funding, but not any every country has a NOAA or something that is really tasked with this robust ocean observing and not only do you need that sort of federal mandate you need a steady stream of trained professionals so good academic structure and then importantly uh, jobs I've talked to people in some countries where they have zero applications this was in Kenya they had zero applications for any of their professional degrees in marine studies because there just simply isn't a good job market and so what philanthropy can do is really facilitate those partnerships by co-financing um, training or investment models between those different uh, players to really uh, sustain ocean observing next slide please so i'm going to talk a little bit about my own experience um, in sort of advancing and sustaining ocean observing and as craig mentioned this has been focused on ocean acidification uh, most places in the world lack ocean acidification monitoring, primarily due to the traditionally high cost and complexity of conducting this, this research. So I work together with many colleagues from NOAA, from the IOC, um, and others, and we basically said, how can we cut costs but not cut quality? Um, and so we developed something called Go On in a Box. Go On stands for the Global Ocean Acidification Observing Network, and it's designed to allow anyone with access to seawater and electricity the ability to measure pH and alkalinity at globally accepted levels of quality. Featured in this kit include the X Prize winning. Uh, pH sensor from Sunburst, which that X Prize was sponsored by Wendy Schmidt. Um, 
So you can see we all work together on this. And then uh, a number of other things. And really what it came down to is that if we removed automation from some of these systems, we cut the cost by a factor of 10. So this whole system is 20,000 US dollars, which is a fraction of what previous systems to measure the carbon system were. And importantly, we think about the use case of these systems in more remote and lesser resource places. And so I remember I was in the lab in Seattle at the NOAA facility here, going over sort of ISAMI maintenance with my partner and going over how, you know, we can instruct our kit recipients. And I kept pointing things out, okay, like what's this part and where's this and where do you get this? My partner said, you know, we just always have these around. They're just here. And I said, well, I, I don't think any of our partners have access, even if it's just a small little plastic fitting or, or or um, you know, a screwdriver that has a specific head. So what we did is we contacted Sunburst and I said, can you put together a package of every little thing you would need to do regular maintenance and can you sell it to me as a maintenance kit? And they'd never done this before because their customers were usually in places where they wouldn't need any of this. But the truth is I was shipping these to Tuvalu and Mauritius. And so these maintenance kits are an example of sort of what needs to go with something if it's really going to fill gaps. Next slide, please. So I want to close with just a couple of what I see as opportunities and challenges for technology and ocean observing. And the first is we know that there is a lot of potential for blue growth, right? And a climate resilient, sustainable blue economy will require a safe and predicted ocean. You might recognize that tagline. I stole it from the UN decade. Um, but some of the fastest growing markets or some of the places that have the most promise for blue growth lack the technical capacity to advance this. So I've heard stories of, you know, ports where a lot of companies just won't go because it's not safe. Uh, the bathymetry just isn't uh, up to date and they really aren't sure that they can dock um, places where, you know, fisheries are not really going to be expanded because the illegal fishing or the piracy is just at a high risk because there's not a, a strong Coast Guard system or um, satellite monitoring. So I think there's a lot of opportunity here for blue tech companies to partner with the governments um, in those places that sort of have that potential to grow, identify those areas of growth and, and co-finance job training programs or, or things like that. Next slide, please. And then uh, the last two points I want to give is one that I sort of mentioned already, but fit for whose purpose? You hear this phrase fit for purpose all the time. And I think people forget that there's um, many times the conversations we're having are just people from highly resourced areas. And the reality is most of the ocean is not in those places. And if we really want to observe it, we're going to need to think about the realities in lesser resource places. I've had situations where somebody couldn't get thick rubber bands, which were the sort of recommended things for sealing bottles to minimize uh, air exchange. And you might think, well, how, how is a rubber band going to slow down, you know, a monitoring program? But it, you really have to kind of co-design these systems or technologies with the end users if you want your technology to be used to fill these gaps. And then finally, I think uh, we have to mention the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which uh, launches in 2021. And really, all the governments of the world have agreed to this. And so you have this sort of government mandate and the decade will be what we make it. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity for blue tech to partner with the governments that have committed to this vision to help fulfill the goals of the decade. And my next slide is just my thank you for inviting me to speak today. Alexa, thank you very much. I'm really taken by the approach that the Ocean Foundation has to emerging economies and to remote areas. And I think there will be a market for the development of low cost and widely distributed observing technologies. And I think you made that point very well. We'll pick that back up in the discussion. Well, now we'll turn to Jason Thompson, Chief Technology Officer of Ocean Kind. Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, so OceanKind is a, a new organization, relatively new. I think I'm the youngest of the three here. Uh, we've been around for about three years, I believe. Um, and, you know, we have a, a philanthropic mission of investing in things that help the ocean and help ocean health. And I manage a portfolio 
uh, that is specifically focused on uh, science and technology and product solutions for ocean health. The way that we think about our portfolio is we, we bucket it into, I guess, the four, what we consider to be the four largest problems facing the ocean. Uh, overfishing is the first one. Uh, the second one is pollution. Uh, habitat destruction is the third, and the fourth is uh, effects of climate change. And we have investments, uh, mostly grants, uh, in all of those areas. And as far as uh, technical approaches, to give you a flavor of the sorts of things, the breadth of things that we invest in, um, the technical approaches vary from, uh, you know, molecular biology tools uh, to, to help understand, uh, you know, thermal resistance in coral reefs, all the way out to, I guess, the topic of, of this uh, session, which is, you know, sensors and robotics. So everything from mechanical and electrical widgets uh, to the smallest, uh, the smallest things in biology. Um, and as far as how we think about our portfolio, uh, to give you a sense of the things that are important to us, I mean, I think with all philanthropic organizations, um, you know, anybody that's donating, whether it's a family office or, or a foundation like Alexis's, uh, the, the donors or the principals typically want, um, they want their money to have impact, right? And so the, the sort of qualitative criteria that we use uh, to think through different opportunities you know, I talked about the importance of the problems that we're solving, um, you know, the, the big four in the ocean. But we also try to down select based on, you know, are these problems uh, well funded or not well funded? Or are the solutions to these problems well funded or not well funded? And so we, we try to look for things that, at least from a financial perspective, are relatively neglected. Um, so things that wouldn't happen if we didn't get involved looking for that you know large incremental impact on 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 our invested dollars things that are uh are scalable um so you know are the the individual grants and the individual programs that we work on you know might not have an enormous impact on their own but you know can they be things that that can be applied in multiple areas uh, multiple geographic locations or or affect multiple different types of ecosystems um so and then the third thing we look for is, uh, you know, places where we can be catalytic. Um, so, you know, can we make investments that could potentially um, uh, reduce the perceived risk uh, for maybe a commercial follow on investment or for a government agency to get involved? Um, and so we think of ourselves as as being given that, you know, we're, we're philanthropic and you know, as a in the organization, we we tend to be more okay with higher risk investments, and so we sort of like to do the earlier stage de-risking and and make things more appetizing to, to other folks down the road. And you know, I'll probably spend a few minutes uh, uh, moving away from that abstract description of what we do, and 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 maybe talk about two program areas. You know, we don't have the same track record that the Ocean Foundation or that uh, Schmidt has, given that we've only been around for a couple of years. And really 2020 was our first uh, full year of grant making. So I definitely um, empathize with Erica's comment about, <laughs> you know, starting these things is, is slower than you'd expect. Um, but two areas related to, to you know, the I guess the, the sensors and the sensing that, um, you know, we're talking about in this panel. One program where we've put, uh, we have a handful of grants out the door is in environmental DNA. And this is, uh, you know, really a nice area for us. You know, we looked at the, the area, you know, about a year and a half ago, we started digging into it. And what I came away from was, this looks like a technology area that is, you know, very promising, but also very nascent. Um, you know, there's a lot of academic work that's been published in the area, a lot of pioneering work done by, you know, scientists, but for it to have impact, um, you know, you need to get it out of these, out of the research lab and into the hands of, you know, resource managers so that you have, you know, people that are not uh, highly trained, uh, you know, highly trained in molecular biology, at least, um, uh, postdocs and grad students running running assays and running experiments, but rather you can get, you know, resource managers doing, you know, routine work, you know, day to day where this is maybe only, 
you know, 10% of their day-to-day -day job, not 100% of their day-to-day -day job. So trying to improve the usability and reduce the cost is, is one, one common theme. And then another broad area that we started looking at more this year um, was passive acoustics for monitoring ecosystems. And this is, again, another one where, you know, it looks like uh, there's some interesting work going on in academia, and we're curious to see if we can both improve the usability by investing in, in groups doing, um, you know, a combination of machine learning and signal processing, as well as reducing the costs of, of the acoustic sensors. So are there, um, you know, sensors that can be built with that, that maybe aren't quite as sensitive and don't have quite the same dynamic range and frequency range as a military grade, uh, you know, hydrophone, but you know, can answer some questions about, you know, did I hear a boat pass through my MPA or, you know, how healthy is my coral reef? Um, and, you know, that's, uh, with all of these things, um, you know, we, are, we mostly invest in these through uh, grants, um, but we do have the capital flexibility to uh, make investments or to do contracting work as well. And so with that, I'll, I'll pass it back. Jason, thank you very much. I, I enjoyed the the tour and the explanation through where Oceankind has headed and is going in the future. And if I look at your areas of focus, the overfishing, pollution, habitat destruction, effects of climate change, I'll combine that with what we heard from Erica. And, and Alexis had mentioned the UN Decade of Ocean Science. I'll probably return to that shortly, but the problems that each of you are willing to undertake are the problems that the global ocean community whether it be the technology community or the applied community, recognize are compelling. And I think it's just, it's stirring to realize that there is private equity, there are private funds that are available to help people along. So as an audience member of TMA Blue Tech, I'm either probably going to be a purveyor or maker of technology, or I'm probably going to be someone who's looking to find the technology that may be coming up through the roots of your investments. Could you each give me a little bit of an inclination as to your willingness to be co-funding? Because we probably also have some, some additional private capital out in the audience of TMA Blue Tech as well. So it, what, what is your approach in partnership where you may have additional sponsors? And then what advice do you have to someone who has a nascent early readiness level technology who wants to be discovered? So it's a two-pronged question. So Jason, why don't you go first, if you don't mind? Um, yeah, as far as co-funding, uh, 10 out of 10, we love it. <laughs> it's, it's, um, um, I think, you know, it's always nice, um, internally, especially when you're working on risky technologies to have some external validation that you're not crazy. Right. And so, so at the earliest end of our TRL range that we invest in, which is probably in the two to three range, you know, you look at that and, and I would say that, you know, if you're really onto something, at least the third of the people you talk to will tell you that, you know, it's a crazy idea. You should not invest in this. It's terrible. Um, but, you know, at least a third of the people should also be telling you that it's a good idea. And so, you know, you know, you have a bad idea if everybody tells you it's, it's a bad idea and you know, you have a bad idea, you know, you're too late if everybody tells you it's a good idea. So finding that sweet spot um, of, of confidence. Um, and I guess the other thing, you know, just to push on this a little bit more is that, you know, even if you're in that sweet spot of, of some people like it, or some, some people sort of see the vision and some don't, um, it's easy to get relatively easy to get external experts to validate your ideas but it's harder to get external people to sit down and say yes this looks like a good idea and i'm going to fund a third or a half or 10 percent or 20 percent and so just you know personal confidence as as somebody managing a portfolio and also you know when we talk about things internally we do a lot of internal diligence i mean it, it just it just helps a ton to get these things um so that approach Jason, thank you. As that approach evolves, then finding someone because you're interested in early readiness level and you want to see this technology mature, finding a partner who might be willing to pick it up and bring it to market would be potentially the ideal partner, right? right. Every, Absolutely. Um, and, sorry, sorry. I was just going to say, and getting those partners involved early on uh, is, is great because even if they don't put in a ton of money to, to allow them to see how it evolves is, is fantastic. Very good, very good. Erica, would you see it the same way? 
Yes, absolutely. I mean, one of the biggest things that we look at is relationship building. And maybe we're looking at it slightly different lens than uh, Ocean Kind. But when we have grantees, we look at it the same as an investor would. You know, it, we're not just giving them money uh, one time and walking away. We want to nurture this relationship. We want to see them grow. We want to see them get to the next stage. So we want to see them get to the investment stage. And we want to start working with those groups early on, as Jason mentioned, to really be able to create that pipeline for them, but also just creating the relationships across the board. We're very interested in creating relationships with um, many different types of investors because we see a lot of groups come across um, our, our plate and we can't fund all of them, but we saw a lot of good ones. And sometimes we'll be able to fund them later. Sometimes we'll be able to recommend them on to funders because perhaps they're too late for our funding, but in a really great stage for investment already. Um, and so it's really that relationship building. And I would say the same for people seeking funding from us. Again, maybe you're too early to get funding from us um, or not quite the right category, but we know people. And if you're a good project and it's good people, that's what we like to bet on. So we want to see these technologies get out into the world. That is our primary goal. And doing that um, involves uh, building the relationships with both the, the tech community and the investment community. Um, and we are more than happy to pass things along or to team up on funding. Thank you, Erica. And Alexis, for the Ocean Foundation, I think the nature of your business is to be teaming with others for co-funding. Could you elaborate, please? Yes, definitely. And when it comes to technology, I think we focus on meeting community needs, like meeting the ocean community needs. And so a lot of what I focus on is putting in funding and my time to really force people to think about use cases in more remote areas. So as an example, um, you know, I'm working with someone based at OSU who's received a lot of funding from NOAA and other places to develop technologies. And I basically have given him a challenge where I said, you know, these are the parameters, this is, these are the specs, and I will give you a contract if you deliver this to me. Now, I can't be the only person funding him. He's an academic researcher. He, you know, relies on a lot of other funding sources, but I can give him a really specific challenge. It's very applied, right? I think we focus on very applied science in terms of the use cases of these technologies. So that's one side, the nitty gritty of, I'm constantly talking to scientists around the world. I am understanding their needs and then I'm communicating that through like challenges that I give with money attached to, to partners. But then on the flip side, getting at something that I think both Jason and Erica mentioned is like get driving more investment in general. I think that is where we need to demonstrate that there is an emerging market for lower cost blue tech and that there could be a lot of customers for this work if it is designed in a way that meets the needs of countries. I mean, even just looking at sargassum inundation in the Caribbean, you could imagine that a country would put in a bulk order of something if it allowed them to handle sargassum inundation because that is such a big issue. So I, I there's kind of, kind of two sides of the coin. Thank you, thank you. Um, what your answer gave me, working in remote areas, looking at, I won't quite call it the democratization of technology, but putting technology in many people's hands through low cost availability is I think going to accompany the awareness and the awakening that we have through the UN decade where the whole world will, will really be engaged and to realize that people who right now don't have the economy to be able to afford to participate in some science collection can be there. So that's kind of, a, to me, a nascent idea. And let me couple that with what Jason said earlier about one third of the population, if, they're, if they've never heard of it, they can't even think of it, maybe you're onto something. If one third is telling you, ah, well, yeah, that's a great idea. Maybe we're not being innovative enough. Imagine, um, I'll go back to the XPRIZE colleagues who introduced to me the term that if you're really innovating, the user doesn't know they need it yet. And we probably have here at TMA Blue Tech, a group of people who have a technology that they're pretty sure the user doesn't know they need yet. 
So how do they approach you? Is there an annual call that you produce in your organizations, an announcement, or do you recommend that people contact you and just diagnose and analyze the potential of what they might have in mind? Maybe we'll go in the reverse order. Alexis, would you like to go first? Sure. Yeah, I am always open to talking to people. You know, every conference I go to, I walk the tables and I talk to all the technology developers and I say, show me what you've got because I order equipment all the time and ship it around the world. But I like my suppliers right now, so you're going to really have to sell me on this. Um, And then what I'll do is I'll usually order something and, and have it tested by one of my trainers who has, you know, that advanced capacity, but who understands the realities in the field. So yeah, for me, it's all about conversations and kind of, I need proof of concept. I need to know that this is going to work for the context I'm deploying it in, but I'm happy to coach, to work with people, to co-develop things. Thank you very much. And Jason, since you kicked that question off in my mind, let me go to you next. Yeah, so our, our grant making process is, uh, quite organic, I would say. And so whether it's myself or, or the folks that work with us, um, you know, we, we rely heavily on networking um, to get to know people and to get to know folks. So whether we're out at a conference or just, I guess now we don't go to conferences anymore, but, you know, getting on the phone and getting on video calls um, with people we know and people we know we know, that's really how, how we get, um, get our ideas and, and find things out. So the opposite of that would be, you um, you know, just making sure that, I mean, if you're part of the community, you know, I, I don't want to say we know everybody in the community, but we're, we're getting to know more and more folks. Um, given we've only been around three years, uh, we have not yet done an open call uh, for proposals yet. It's something that we'll probably do eventually, um, but we, we just haven't kicked that, um, kicked that can yet. Thank you. There we go. Sure, I'd say that we are, evolving in this process. So we're very much at the stage and still continue to do what Jason mentioned, which is organic. We talk to a lot of people. We have people contact us frequently through email or what used to be meetings and conferences. Uh, We openly reach out to people that we read about their tech, um, maybe through a press release or something that we find intriguing. And so we actively go after um, trying to get information from those folks. But as we have evolved, uh, we've also opened up a portal now, so now people can actively submit an abstract. And it comes down to bandwidth and funding. And again, uh, there's a lot of interesting ideas out there, so we welcome talking to as many people as we possibly can. That We might not be able to fund everyone, but if you truly have a great idea and a really good team, which we, again, like to bet on the people, um, then we'd really like to engage with you because we might know another person interested in funding your particular type of project, or it might be something we want to fund in the future. Um, So our limitation right now is just the bandwidth of getting back to you, but we do have uh, the open portal for call for proposals now. So we've formalized this process a little bit and we still have an informal side to it. So sort of a hybrid. Very good. So, so even though we don't have the meetings, but they will return, we have every confidence that we'll be, we'll be back to some reinvented, seascape of normal, if you will. And when that comes, we'll get back to some of the habits we had. But in the meantime, people can be reaching out to you electronically, set up video calls, etc. So I would say pretty safe bet for anyone who is, is part of this, this gathering knows that if they've got a keen technology or if they're interested in co-funding, they can reach you and they can they can pursue these opportunities with you. Now, there's a term we've been using, I think everyone is familiar with it, but readiness levels or TRL, technology readiness levels. And just for those who you might not be familiar, it's it's basically a one through nine scale that at least in my world, we borrowed in the ocean community from NASA and the Defense Department as they looked at the, the maturity of technology. So the early readiness level is the keen idea as you work your way on up through levels of proof and levels of reliability, you get then to the point of transitioning into use and operations, which is when, for example, Lexus is going to buy from a maker and start deploying. And and where maybe in the mid or early readiness levels, as we heard from Erica and from Jason, you're willing to hand off to someone else thereafter. Can, Can I ask Erica and Jason, where do you then look for that receiving party? What type of of interest would be the receiving party when you're done with the earlier 
readiness levels and you're passing it on to someone else. I think I know where Alexis is, where it's proven. Now let's go deploy into developing communities or to distant and remote communities. But for, for Erica and for Jason, could you give us a little explanation? Where's the next set of hands that would take your product? Who'd like to go yeah, first? Erica, yeah, perhaps sure. you would. Uh, yeah, I can jump in really quick on that. Um, we look at it in a couple of different areas. One, we look for investors. Uh, so we continue to try to have uh, conversations with um, different types of like private family offices to larger investors. Um, and then in addition to that, we look at people that are interested in getting this into the market. So it doesn't always have to be investment. Um, we're looking for users, uh, people that might want to buy or um, pilot this type of technology and bring that out into um, the commercialization in that regard, um, normalizing that type of tech. Because as Jason said, some of this technology that we bet on, uh, it's not just de-risking it um, in terms of funding for investment, but it's all de-risking it in terms of use. So then that would be where we would go on to someone like Alyssa and say, hey, we found this very cool type of you know project that we've been working on for a while funding and would you be interested in trying to use this even to the point of maybe us funding uh several of those units for someone to distribute um so those are the kinds of things that we're looking at those types of partnerships and investment opportunities thank you erica jason what do you think uh yeah we have a similar view of the world i think um you know for the things that can be turned into products, I think the, the solution there is obvious, is, is to find private capital investment, for-profit investment capital, whether that's you know, from venture capital, if, you, if you're starting a company, or maybe you're licensing technology to a larger company and, and they want to create a new sub-product, and it sort of depends on the specifics of the individual project. Um, I think for things that that might not be able to be uh, turned into a product, then, you know, I would say like the two giant pools of capital in the world, you know, one is, is private investment capital um, and the other one is governments, right? And, and grant funding and things like that. And so another path may be um, to, uh, to reduce the risk and, and, and demonstrate the usability enough that maybe an organization like yours, like NOAA might say, oh, okay, you know, this is a thing that we can now support because um, it doesn't look like it's like a crazy idea anymore. Um, so, so those would be the two main, main avenues that we would look at. Craig, can I add something here? Please do, Alexis. I, I, this brings up a point that I've come with. So I speak to a lot of government donors or de development agencies, right? These are big dollars, like the Global Environment Facility. There might be a $20 million project for the region. And a lot of times when I talk about ocean technology, they say, oh, no, no, we don't fund technology. We don't fund monitoring. But for example, they might be trying to reduce risk to climate change or improve, you know, fishery health. And so what I found is if you say this is for management, this is to inform management, it, it goes really well. So I think there's also an untapped potential to have technology play a much bigger role in those projects by by framing it appropriately within their language. Alexis, that's a huge and important point. And, and as I migrate very quickly then to the notion that was brought up earlier by several of our speakers, the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. This is going to be the globe's attention on this opportunity to bring oceans front and center. And it's for that sustainable development and societal benefit that the science is being performed. And I think when any of us tries to sell an idea it often, if you're just in a science community, it's gonna stand on its own merit within the intrigue of that science conversation. But if you wanna sell it to the general public or the potential investor, we need to be talking about the societal aim that it seeks to achieve and the purpose that it will fulfill. Well, we're tight on time, but if I could just ask each of you to give a very quick summary of your top three hits. What was the ideal project that you have found so far? Maybe let's make it two, just given the time that we have available. Two examples, because I'm in the audience, I'm listening to this, I'm intrigued, I don't want to contact you, but it would be nice to see what you have found to be a success in, in your win list already. That would help me dial in where I need to, to project. So let's start with Erica, please. 
sure. I'm actually going to do trends instead because that's really what we've identified at this stage. So we're very, very happy with the trends that we've seen, um, the engagement within the ocean tech and outside the ocean tech community as we've built this program. We feel that uh, we see our grantees time and time coming in uh, on Slack channels as people involved in questions of solving ocean tech challenges. We see them receiving more funding, going through different accelerators. Uh, we also see more people coming on board with investment and asking us and our grantees and our network questions. So we're very, very happy about the network that we have started to create. Uh, and the second one is the collaboration that we've seen actually between our grantees. So at least three different projects have come out of our grantees getting together for these annual conferences and really networking their interesting ideas together and going, look, we could do something even better or bigger than what we're doing now. So I think I'll, those are the two I could give you at the moment. Thank you. Thank you. Jason, your top two. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to um, modify my answer a little bit because given that we've only been around for three years, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, hesitant to claim any success <laughs> just yet. Um, but like uh, Erica, I mean, there, there are a couple of things that uh, you know I've been excited about. Um, I talked about two of them, you know, at the at the start of the call, you know, in, in environmental DNA and passive acoustics. But um, maybe to to broaden it out a little bit, um, you know, some of the things that that have been interesting is, and I think both of these projects are, are examples of this, is bringing um, technologies or expertise from outside of the ocean space into it. So, you know, eDNA is an example, um, you know, there's billions of dollars of research investment into biotech uh, that went into, you know, the enabling technologies that make that a useful tool or a potentially useful tool. So that's one example of, of translating work from another field into, into ocean science and ocean observation. Um, and then another one is, is you know, particularly as we're doing early stage technology investment, trying to pull in uh, some expertise that you don't typically see in that early stage, you know, technology uh, development work. So whether that's bringing in, uh, you know, people with expertise in high volume manufacturing, so you can actually make things low cost um, at scale, bringing in product design people so that you can actually make things that people want to use and not just, you know, the engineers can use it because they built it, <laughs> but get it you know, into the hands of resource managers to, you know, Alexis's point of, you know, most of the things that we're looking at, not all of them, but a lot of them really we're pushing them towards management, right? Like, so if you're going to measure something, well, let's get this into the hands of the, the person that's managing the resource. So those, those are two things that, that sort of, and, and I guess the broad theme there is in my mind is translational work. So taking it out the lab and into the field. Very good. Very good. Alexis? That's a really good segue to what I was going to say, which is co-design and case studies. So, you know, mm -hmm. if you can co-design the technology with an end user, and then in that process, you actually gain a case study that explains the utility of that technology. And oftentimes it's those case studies that get people excited, especially people who are not engineers or not ocean scientists who see that application. So that's what I've been trying to do more and more is do this co-design and uh and then share the stories of the first implementations or uses of those technologies excellent excellent well i'm watching the time here and i realize we've pushed our limits just a little bit but this has been richly informative and i think for anyone intending to pursue these avenues you realize now if you're if you're joining us here at the tma blue tech and, and blue tech week that you know that there's a role with philanthropy and foundations and finding an opportunity for ocean observing technology. And I'm inspired because somebody coming from NOAA and my responsibility is for the research in NOAA, it's climate, oceans and weather research. Everything that you have discussed, each of the three of you here is particularly stimulating for me because it's at the root of what the needs are in the ocean science community, Jason in particular, eDNA and acoustics, passive acoustics in particular, and for, for Erica and for Alexis, as we start looking at the subjects that you brought in, the remote access and delivering capability at low cost, that's how we're going to be measuring, for example, ocean acidification in a global way with local stewards making those observations for us. And Erica, for sustainable fisheries, 
You looked also at enabling ocean research in ways that are new ergonomic, economic. The COVID world makes us realize that that's a necessity. Habitats, plastics, I think those are very similar to the pollution attributes that, that Jason had mentioned. So I think we've really wrapped up a very good collective here of what subjects count what mechanisms exist and how important philanthropy is as an opportunity for somebody who's a new developer or somebody who's looking to pick up developed technology, make investments in it and bring those into delivery. So to the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners and Erica, to the Ocean Foundation and Alexis and to Oceankind and Jason, I wanna say thank you very much. I've enjoyed this session and I'll turn back now to our moderator with our collective thanks and thanks to our panelists. Good morning. My name is Emanuele Di Lorenzo, and I'm the founding chairman of Ocean Visions and also professor and director of the Ocean Science and Engineering at Georgia Tech. It is my pleasure today to have the opportunity to introduce to you Ocean Visions, a multi organization initiative to transform science and engineering into scalable ocean solutions to climate change and the planet grand challenges. As you're all well aware, there is a growing interest from investors in sustainable ocean businesses and solutions. The panel on the right hand side shows the S&P 500 stock market index over the last few decades and compares it to the MSCI KLD 400 index, which only tracks companies with outstanding environmental, social and governance ratings. The point is that sustainable, responsible investments are not only profitable, but are also good for the planet. In fact, over the last decade, we have seen the emergence of many great initiatives that aim to accelerate the development of sustainable ocean businesses and solutions, both from the private sector, for example, the Benioff Ocean Initiatives, from youth groups like the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, but also industry and intergovernmental organizations such as the United Nations and their upcoming launch of the Ocean Decades for Sustainable Ocean Development. Indeed, there is a, now a constellation of ocean-focused businesses, and here is just a, a logo deck that I borrowed from some of the websites. However, while a sustainable blue economy is an important component of ocean solutions, there are still grand challenges linked to climate change and human pressures that require critical ecosystem-level thinking and solutions. Researchers and universities have made it clear that they want to move beyond understanding and describing the ocean grand challenges and actively engage in transforming research into scalable ocean solutions. However, there are still important barriers that need to be overcome. This new fast growing landscape of innovators, startup investors in the area of the sustainable blue economy is fundamental for ocean solutions, but is often not well connected to researchers and universities. In fact, the contributions from the research community to ocean solutions remain fragmented. The goal of Ocean Vision is to bridge this gap and to develop an integrated global ecosystem for ocean solutions that allows a synergistic alignment of researchers, innovators and investors to target the grand challenges while still supporting an array of ocean solutions for the sustainable blue economy. In 2019, research institutions in the United States signed an agreement to establish the Ocean Visions Consortium and Network with the goal to jumpstart this global open ocean community to co-design and deploy ocean solutions to climate change and the planet's grand challenges. The consortium includes traditional oceanographic institutions such as Scripps, Woods Hole, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, Skidaway, strong engineering schools such as George Tech, MIT, and Stanford, and education and outreach institutions such as the Smithsonian, the Georgia Aquarium, Monterey Bay Aquarium, and others. With this in mind, the near-term activities and goals of Ocean Visions have focused on establishing this ocean solution multi-sector community. And here is a picture of our first summit in 2019 uh, when Ocean Vision was first launched. The second goal is to accelerate the transfer of research into solutions for ocean grand challenges by rapid prototyping, development and deployment. So you may ask, what are the grand challenges that Ocean Vision is targeting? The first one is ocean-based solutions to the climate crisis. The second is equitable resilience and adaptation of coastal system. The third is ocean-based food security. The fourth is countering marine biodiversity loss. The fifth is greening the direct human footprint of the ocean. 
To advance solutions for these grand challenges, we have established the Ocean Vision Inc., a nonprofit organization that coordinates and facilitates key activities such as targeted projects, task force, and events, and ensures that these activities are co designed and implemented with the Ocean Vision Innovation Partnership. This partnership is compromised by a diverse group of non academic organizations and actors that work together synergistically to accelerate solutions and rapid prototyping, development, and deployment. The consortium offers partners an efficient access to rigorous peer review of the proposed ocean solutions and can bring additional on-demand expertise and research to the more challenging problems through the Ocean Vision Network. The research consortium, the innovation partnership, and the nonprofit together constitute the Ocean Vision Network and engine. Ocean Vision continues to seek partnership with a diverse set of organizations who can help advance different elements of the ocean solution missions. These include NGOs, nonprofit, financial institutions and foundation, accelerator programs, industry groups, etc. At the moment, some of the formal and informal partners include the AIM Partners Ocean Fund, the Ocean Conservancies, the UNESCO Intergovernmental Ocean Commissions, the World Economic Forum through their Uplink platform, the American Geophysical Unions, and others. Now that I have provided you with an overview of the Ocean Vision Engine, I would like to give you a brief overview of our ongoing activities to date. We have two out of five task forces that are operational, one focused on ocean-based solution to the climate crisis, and the other on equitable resilience and adaptation of coastal systems. The first task force aims at building actionable roadmaps for developing, testing, and deploying ocean carbon dioxide removal technologies. Among the technologies being considered are microalgal cultivation and sequestration, ocean alkalinization, and electrochemical CO2 stripping. And for more information, please reach out to the Ocean Vision Executive Director, Brett Ock, and our Science Director, David Kowick, who is also a senior fellow at the, ocean, at the Stanford Center for Ocean Solutions. Now, to move the carbon dioxide research to applicable and scalable solution, Ocean Visions and the Jeremy and Hanelor Grantham Environmental Trust announced just last month a new partnership to work together to deploy a large fund, approximately 10 million per year, to prototype, test, and deploy a broad portfolio of ocean climate solutions. The other task force is on equitable coastal solutions, aims at developing a set of core hyperlocal observation and prediction services for coastal flooding resilience that are equitable and accessible to global underserved coastal communities. These involve citizen-driven citizen -driven science and engagement solutions, and affordable, innovative sensor technology and modeling. This task force will be coordinated through the International Geos and Coastal Predict programs of the UN Ocean Decade for Sustainable Development. We also have a series of planned and ongoing events, including solution workshops for ocean carbon sequestration removal and coastal flooding, an uncommon dialogue to be held at Stanford on finance solution for the coastal ocean, and our next Ocean Vision Summit in 2021, hosted at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and coordinated across four international campuses at the University of Cape Town in South Africa, University of Tasmania in Australia, and the Guillemar in Kiel, Germany. We also have some projects, and I here want to mention the development of the GEOS program under the UN Decade for Ocean Sustainable Development to establish a vibrant global ecosystem for ocean solutions modeled around the ocean vision concept. So I gave you a short presentation of Ocean Visions and its effort. We like to refer ourselves as the wave of change starts with the ripple. We began with a few institutions and researchers that had an interest in accelerating the transfer of research into solutions. Since inception in late 2017, today we have assembled a growing research consortium, which is already an important step forward in its own merit, if you know how hard it is to reach multi-university agreements. And we also have a series of ongoing efforts. If you're a researcher or university and want to get involved, please join the Ocean Vision Network. If you're an innovator, business, investor, or fund, please partner with us to co-develop the Ocean Vision ecosystem. In closing, I want to thank you for your time. We live in an era that requires all hands on deck to restore and preserve a planet that is healthy and habitable for human. As Jane Lubchenco pointed out, 
the ocean is finite and cannot bear the impacts of climate change in humans indefinitely. However, the ocean also holds an immense potential for solutions, and Ocean Vision is one of many attempts to catalyze our best minds, talents, and resources to this end. Thank you very much for your time. Well, I guess I'm not in any panel, but uh, here I am uh, live, uh, and uh, I would be happy if there's any questions or further clarification. Um, this is sort of a, an odd interface because I don't see anyone. So um, I, I, I'm right here. <laughs> Okay. Hey, Michael. Hey, Manuel, it's uh, nice to meet you electronically, and that was a very interesting presentation. Um, maybe I could ask you a question. You you very quickly threw up. Um, what you were looking for, you said if you're interested to participate, um, and and you left, uh, you know, it showed a couple of places. In my case, it cut off the last piece. But um, I am curious, how are you? How do you want industry to participate? And I'm particularly talking about small to medium-sized companies as opposed to the big ones that maybe have traditional resources and would know about something like this. How how do you reach out? How do you how do you anticipate that you can create value for small companies that live hand to mouth in terms of, of uh, their their existence? Well, yeah, I mean, one 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 model that that, that we we actually were exploring through the Ocean CDR and the Grantham Environmental Trust is the idea that uh, some industries uh, may be interested to expand their portfolio of technologies that they're developing. And to do that, it is possible to connect with the Ocean Vision Network to, to bring in additional expertise to explore those avenues and potentially obtain seed funding to explore these technologies. Um, so I think, you know, for, for a small company that is just at the beginning of their, you know, that they, they live from one day to the other, uh, the potential to access uh, a, a broader expertise to further improve certain services or certain technologies is, is where potentially there's a, a good connection, if that makes sense. No, it does. And maybe I could uh, drill a little further. Um, so I think you mentioned that, that there might be, I don't know the right words, but I'll say prototyping, you know, figuring out how to go right. to production. And some of your, the partners in this vision uh, are engineering firms uh, and or have strong engineering. Um, some are more traditional oceanographic institutions, as you pointed out, and some educational institutions. So, so if a small company that is maybe prototyping innovative technology now needs to go to production. Is that something you could help companies with? Would they come to you and say, gosh, you know, I've got this amazing thing, and you say that fits really well with the vision, and we could fit you in with MIT or with Georgia Tech, and we can do prototyping with you, or we can do production modeling for you. Yes, uh, that is absolutely the case. That uh, the the Ocean Vision Network focus is also on trying to provide that additional expertise where it's needed. So, if there is a company that is in the phase of prototyping, the whole point is that rather than doing it alone, it can be a more open process where. You know, to the extent that you know, with all the legal complications, but it can be an open process where we actually bring to the table more experts to make sure that certain technologies work. Now, with that said, I want to make it clear that Ocean Vision is not a funding agency of any sort. So, all of these uh, kind of relationships would have to be trialed on a on a one to one basis to see what is the best way to move forward. Uh, but in general, the idea is exactly that: that we are here to engage. Uh, with companies to try to implement, prototype, deploy uh, new solutions. Yes. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, I saw the the um, the interest areas. Um, often companies are dealing in 
something a little more specific. And I'll give you an example. In the last panel, um, Jason Thompson talked about um, using uh, passive acoustic uh, arrays uh, to listen more to the ocean. And there is this relatively new field of understanding ocean noise pollution. And so if somebody has an innovative technology, even though it doesn't seemingly fit into one of the bubbles or boxes that you were showing, should they approach this group? Or do you kind of say, well, that doesn't really fit very well? As I said, you know, we, we, we entertain a portfolio of possible solutions. But, it, but one of our goals is, of course, to target the big challenges that often remain pending. And so we, that's our, our first charge. But having said that, we, you know, the Ocean Vision Network also provides a community where these other ideas are also being discussed, are also being kind of brainstormed on with the Ocean Vision Network. So if there are these smaller concepts that come arise, we're not just going to say oh, we're not interested. We're just going to try to connect you uh, with the people that are working in that area. And, you know, we have events where, you know, these things can be uh, further discussed and, and, and brainstormed on. If, if that makes sense. Otherwise, you know, yeah. Well, I think it's wonderful. I'm so pleased that you were introduced to us by, by Scripps. And, and obviously, today is our day that we're doing jointly with Scripps Institution Oceanography. They're one of your partners. They're one of our partners. Um, so we look forward to working with you. So thank you very much for your, thank you. your uh, presentation. Uh, comment quickly. The idea is that the research community wants to engage with this new landscape that is growing around the blue sustainable economy and wants to engage to, you know, humbly to try to really contribute in a meaningful way, you know, and make it really a two-way exchange. And so we're shaping up ourselves to organize our own community so that it's ready to engage in a way that makes sense also for us uh, from the academic standpoint. Well, I hope you're Thank able you. to participate the next couple of days. We have 150 companies that'll will be presenting today, tomorrow, Thursday. So uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks very much. Thank you. Well, I know that this last session is the call to action and next steps. And, and uh, I was asked to jump in to um, just participate and ride your coattails. So Margaret and, and, uh, and Craig, um, I, I've learned a lot today. I, I, it was an amazing uh, series of speakers. And Craig, you did it a couple of days ago, I guess. But the last panel before this, was the uh, philanthropy's role, which I thought was really quite remarkable. Uh, but every panel has been interesting. So I guess I would like to ask the two of you, um, Margaret, I don't know if you had a chance to be there all day, but uh, you know, what do you see as the call to action today and, and the next steps? And let's just have a little dialogue about what do we do and what role does TMA Blue Tech and other clusters play as well in that? So. Uh, I'll ask the hard questions, and you guys have all the answers, I'm sure. Great. Well, thanks, Michael, and thanks for uh, helping to organize this. And uh, all of your staff worked so hard with us to ensure that we could yep. get this great array of people that were here to talk to us today. I yes, think absolutely. That, uh, a couple of things uh, really stood out to me today, and that was the, the broadening of the uh, the communities and the, yes. the focus of those communities and their technology on uh, on observing systems on solutions and so forth and i think that uh, you know we saw ocean acoustics and the use of passive acoustics uh, in a much broader array than we've seen at previous uh, tma meetings 
Uh, we also saw this new ocean hydrography, especially this challenge of mapping the seafloor, uh, a very different kind of observing than we've talked about traditionally, and then the environmental DNA. And so I, I think that one challenge is how do we uh, effectively uh, work with, uh, with each of those communities and how can we start connecting them? Because, you know, if you think about the, the challenges that we're, think, that we're faced with, whether it's fisheries or managing coastal environments or responding to climate change impacts, uh, it's going to take a variety of approaches and it, it's really all of that. It's the physics, it's the, the, uh, the seafloor, it's the biological communities. So how do we link all of that activity? And then uh, I think we, uh, Craig and I can also talk about uh, the UN decade and how do we get all of this into the decade because we are the decade. It's not something over there that's the UN, it's all of us. So how do we connect all of this so that the decade is a big success? I'll stop there and let Craig uh, Craig, why don't you want to talk about the day and then let's talk about the ocean decade and how do we make sure that all these partners, come, these people come together? Unfortunately, you're on mute. All right, so I could say this, Michael, as a retired ship captain, I always survived with the electronics technicians bailing me out of which buttons to push. <laughs> and you can see that that's still happening now. So, Yes, yeah, so it, delightful to be here with you, Margaret. Always wonderful to be sharing any event with you. And, and Michael, yet another home run hit for you and the team at TMA Blue Tech. If I could ever have imagined a hit list of the 18 players across so many subjects, they were on the podium today speaking. And as Margaret said, that is another transformational change that I'm seeing in the way that Blue Tech Week is really bringing in the best of the best to be offering the most up to date keen observations and, and sharing the information with us. And I'm also seeing a melting of what had been the, the triple helix. Now the triple helix as originally defined and as Michael, you, you've been very proud to offer that as a model. I think it's a very appropriate model where we have academia, we have industry and we have government. And it does take all three to make some of this work of the clusters and what we're trying to accomplish here as an integrated community really take off and run. But I'm, I'm increasingly seeing the solution to a problem I had highlighted a couple of years ago, which is that we don't speak the same language. The scientists don't speak the same language that the, the government people speak. The government people don't speak the language of business and industry. But I think the translation keys are being written. They're being developed. And I've also said that there are enzymes in, in the reaction here to allow the triple helix to do its job. Michael Jones is one such enzyme that does the translational explanation to each of the parties as to why we need each other and how we could do so much more together. And I think the series of talks today showed a lot of that, but I'll also offer, uh, offer for some of the other clusters, these types of enzymes, if you don't have that key person, maybe a Joshua Berger up in Seattle, if uh, a Peter Heffernan in Ireland, a Miguel Marx in Portugal, if you don't have that, you can find it, ladies and gentlemen. You can go out and find that, that translational key. We heard yesterday in some of the talks, I just want to reach back, some of the services of the academic community, MIT, for example, or some of the economics schools and programs have been able to provide that. Or as in Miguel Marx, Pricewaterhouse is able to do that in Europe. So I would, I would offer to folks, if you feel like you're not connecting, but yet you know there's an opportunity there, and we've seen opportunities ripen in today's talks as evidence of it. Go find the people that could be that communication vehicle. Maybe it's not me. Maybe I'm too much of a government person. Maybe it's not my colleague. Maybe that person's too much of an industry person. But you can melt those languages together. So what I saw today also that really excited me was that people are starting to realize what some are starting to call now the, the not just the blue economy, but the new blue economy. Data has value, and information products can be rendered with data. Much of the data is free, open, and publicly available. 
I wish we could get it all together in one, one solid place so that keen minds can not worry about how we collect the data. That's one community of engineers and practitioners and seagoing people. But what to do with that information, whether it's hydrography, whether it's eDNA, whether it's a, a renewal of, of how we assess the Earth's health, the pulse, the respiration, the, the Gray's anatomy, right? That's mapping. That's the hydrography of, of, the, of the world. So once we have that information, people can do amazing things with it. That's a business. That's an industry. That's a service to the public all and into itself. And that became clear to me through the series of subjects that we review here today. So... I, I also want to look at, um, just as you mentioned, the role of philanthropy, and philanthropy is coming on strong with some very heavy investors who are willing to kickstart, do good, help people along, and then recycle, get out of that cycle, start again, bootstrapping some new technologies that may be found in the laboratories of universities of the, of the world, and be able to mature that. So the, the, the micro machines of the big enterprise, which is the, the, the TMA Blue Alliance, Blue Technologies, and, and looking at our, um, our clusters, the, there are micro machines being established now inside this cluster network model. And I think the right size can be found by the right people if that interest is, is there to be rewarded. So I'm, I'm remarkably buoyed by what's happening here, Michael. In a few short years, I'm seeing an alignment I'm seeing a melting of the, the very, very small fences that people need to jump over in order to be working across disciplines and, and across communities from which they, they hail. And, and we're, we're making progress here. So I think if, uh, if any new incoming administration wants to look at what opportunities there are for the nation, as many people have observed, even before it became campaign slogans, if we're going to do better, we've got to stop doing what we've been doing and start anew. And in order to start anew, the marine economy, the blue economy, is front and center in order to be able to do that, whether it's feeding people, providing power and energy for the nation, or whether it's providing coastal resilience to where most of the, the financial investment of privately held landowners is accumulated along the coast. So I'll stop there and, and we'll maybe take a turn and, and go a little bit closer to the decade because I think that's a sweet billboard on the side of the road advertising oceans to everyone who will pass it over the next 10 years. You know, it's interesting. Ten years ago, and I know you've heard this story, when I first went to, uh, to NOAA, uh, and ten years ago when we were talking with Scripps, uh, the blue economy really wasn't in the vernacular, uh, and blue tech wasn't in the vernacular. And while every day you, you feel like, you know, the decisions you're making seem like they're being made in a void, in actual fact, there's like a vortex, and, and it's getting, it's moving in the right direction, and I think it's swirling in the right direction. When you think about the two of you being on, you know, on a panel like this, talking the way you are, I am, in fact, writing the Rosetta Stone at night, just trying to get the translation between science and government and industry. But um, one of the things that, that was discussed yesterday um, and will be discussed again tomorrow morning is this incredible report, The Mission Starfish. Uh, and Peter Heffernan talked about this yesterday. Um, and, you know, Peter's got amazing bona fides in terms of the work that he's done and the Galway Statement and uh, just the international reputation that he enjoys. And he is one of the co-authors of the, of the Mission Starfish, where the EU is essentially creating food, five large missions, and one is ocean and water coming together. And tomorrow morning, I've actually previewed the, uh, the, the videotaped um, presentation from John Bell, and John will be talking about the vision at the EU, and particularly the mission Starfish. And I hope everyone that's listening right now uh, will join us, because I think that mission Starfish uh, is an amazing document, and I'm very hopeful that the United States uh, will embrace something similar. So um, I look forward to tomorrow continuing, but let's talk about the decade. How do we make sure the decade isn't too much science? I mean, I want it to be science, but we want it to be more than science. You know, for a long time, the scientists were doing amazing work in the ocean, and they were all by themselves doing amazing work in the ocean. And now I think they're being embraced. And now people are saying, 
there's opportunities, there's businesses that can come out of this, and we need to harness that brain power and do tech transfer and create companies, and that's where philanthropy can play a role, and where the uh, SBIR work from, from government plays a role and new investors come in. So how do we make sure that this decade, which is so important, um, that we, we bring all the, all the actors to the table? Well, I think one of the really important things is that the actors go to the table. You know, it's um, the way that the decade works is it, it's not, you know, it, it's not like the UN sitting there and sending you an engraved invitation to say, oh, you know, won't you come to the table? It's they've created the table, they've put all of this stuff on it, and now we have the responsibility to go to it. So I think especially for this community, uh, it, it's really putting the ideas out there and saying we're going to play. So uh, in mid-October, the UN released a call for action that was uh, for two things. One, uh, programs, and programs are defined as multi-year, multidisciplinary, uh, multinational activities. And, and then for contributions uh, to financial and in-kind contributions to the decade. And I think a lot of people have sort of hung back saying, oh, well, you know, I don't, I'm not sitting on uh, $50 million or $100 million uh, to do something, so I can't propose. Uh, but that's not the case. The, the decade is looking for ideas for uh, endorsement, not funded programs for endorsement. So as the, as the, um, the corporate world and the business world sits out there, you know, if, you're think, if you are thinking about things that you want to do, big ideas that you have, uh, put them in and the UN will, will look at all of the things and they may come to you and say, oh, you know, there are four other companies that are interested in this and here's who they are and you know we suggest that you get together or there are uh, there are other there are research institutions or nonprofits or NGOs uh, that are interested in these big ideas you may want to collaborate with them so I think the first thing is we've got to come to the table uh, I'll let Craig uh, talk as well I, I enjoy Margaret's comment. I think that's right on the money. We need participation. We need the people. And the people represent a number of different issues. And as, as Margaret often reminds us, uh, Margaret and I, in case some of the viewers are not aware, we're on the what is called the executive planning group. We are two of the 20 people who are part of that. Five of those 20 are actually from the United States, and the other 15 are from really every continent except Antarctica. And, and we have quite a broad coverage of the interests that need to be addressed. But if you missed it, if you've gone to the Our Ocean Conference or paid attention to the UN Conference on Oceans or any of the international meetings that describe the state of the oceans, you now know the agenda of what the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development is trying to achieve. And that last phrase, for sustainable development, development when we're talking about oceans, that's a euphemism for the blue economy, ladies and gentlemen. So we're very consistent in what we're pursuing and it's arising at so many levels. It's arising from TMA Blue Tech, it's arising from clusters, it's arising from the United Nations through the decade. We all know the direction we need to get in and, and, and join in that voyage. It's a question of how we align the communities and meetings such as this are, are some of the best I've ever seen where you bring all the different facets that are necessary to come to the table. And how do you do this so it's not just science, Michael? As Margaret said, we have to get to the people who can identify the societal need or societal change that is necessary. And I'll tie that back to Peter Heffernan's work on, on this, the starfish vision. And, and for some folks who aren't really acquainted with it, it might be a, a diminutive title for a remarkably visionary outlook that the European Union has to be combining water, oceans, and all matters that relate to both so that there's truly a vision of where we're going. And I think, I, I think by fear of too much experience in government, I must say, we are too trapped and trained to be thinking three years out because that's the budget cycle. And you can't 
you can't fix things in three years. You have to have a long-term plan, and it's not the appetite that our, our governmental planners and, and funding authorities generally look for. We need to have a longer horizon vision. We need to have an inspirational vision. And I think the EU has found a pathway for it in what you will hear more about tomorrow. So, I, Michael, I join you. I encourage folks to look at that. I'll just make one or two more comments here. The decade, for those of you who remember Jacques Cousteau and were inspired by Cousteau, or Rachel Carson, Silent Spring, and her other writings, they were remarkably persuasive. And they recruited a good number of people for the oceans, either to save the oceans, conserve the oceans, the excitement and discovery of oceans. I do believe, I think we all believe, that the decade, when it's front and center and in, in everyone's mindfulness, is going to be that second wave of recruitment. And we only get these things once in a lifetime, if once in a career, perhaps, that it's going to happen. So we need to be engaging the business community. We need to be engaging civic leaders, public leaders. Even farmers in Iowa need to be mindful of what climate change is doing to their annual profit based on weather impacts and changes in weather and climatic patterns. So no one escapes this and the oceans are the driver and we need to be bringing a greater awareness and identify the needs and then through science we'll find those solutions. One last thing, I mentioned that Margaret and I are on the, the executive planning group. We are, we are two of 20. There's one special person of the 20 who is an early career professional. Her name is Erin Satherthwaite. And Aaron is a West Coast PhD scientist, journey, a journey person scientist, uh, well-credentialed, but an early career scientist. See, in the federal system, we're not allowed to say, as a federal employee, I'm not allowed to say this is a young person because we have to stand a sconce of <laughs> I mean, infer inference of, uh, of age-based discrimination. But, but we will start the decade, but we will probably not finish it. It's going to be the yeah. young people today who are early in their careers whether they be dive masters and scuba instructors that are helping to understand and socialize the importance of oceans, or whether they're PhD scientists or financial analysts that are looking at the wisdom of avoiding stranded assets, seeking circular economies, and making the proper types of investments that would relate to a healthy planet, so much of which is the ocean. So we have very little time left. Um, I guess I heard a call to action which is number one, we've made huge progress in the last 10 years. Um, we have uh, 620 attendees registered as of this morning for our first time ever virtual event from 30 countries, so truly international. Um, our, our title this year is Aqua Optimism, uh, Blue Tech and SDGs, because we need to tie the Blue Tech and the SDGs together with being optimistic. And so I think our call to action is that we need to continue to bring these three strands, the academia industry, sorry, academia and education, industry, policymakers together as intimately as possible. And in terms of next steps, um, it certainly seems like uh, the decade, which is just around the corner, um, is a great place to be doing that. And, and Margaret, thank you to you and your team for suggesting the Ocean Visions. Maybe after this, we can have a chat about how maybe we can work with them because part of this isn't just San Diego, just Washington, D.C., it's the whole country. And making sure that we've got partners all around, across the country and all around the world is, I think, critically important and to me is part of our next steps. So I, I know that we will never finish a topic as big as this, but thank you for your comments both on, on kind of where we are and the call to actions. And do we agree that next steps is perhaps um, figure out how we can, we from industry can, can better integrate into the, into the uh, decade of ocean sciences? You guys would like that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Margaret, we should we should set up an appointment soon to have that call. And I have a feeling we're being cut off at this point. So, thank you to the TMA team for a great day. Uh, please join us uh, the next couple of days. It'll be it'll be fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.